I'm going to talk about the symbolism of Christianity today, and I want to begin by making some introductory remarks. First of all, concerning the psychological approach to to the Bible in general, and then secondly, more specifically, to the psychological approach to the uh, to the Christian image. You know, the 20th century is witnessing the emergence of a whole new viewpoint that's growing out of depth psychology. And this new viewpoint is now a, a science that studies and charts the psyche as an experienceable, objective phenomenon. Heretofore, humanity has been so close to the psyche that it couldn't see it. And it's still hard for us to see the psyche because we're so close to it. It's very difficult to realize that the psyche and the I, the ego, are two separate things. Very difficult. And this, uh, this new capacity has just begun to emerge in 20th century man. And what this new attitude is then able to do is to take all the old, the old data that, that humanity's very existence has rested upon. I'm talking about religious and mythological data. And reinterpret or re-understand that data in terms of the reality of the objective psyche. What it amounts to then is that what has heretofore been experienced by man as metaphysical reality, uh, the content of dogmatic creeds can now be seen to be the phenomenology of the objective psyche. Um, that's easy to say, but exceedingly difficult to, uh, to fully assimilate. But that is what the new science of depth psychology uh, is in the process of bringing about. Did you just say that last sentence? <laughs> <laughs> People keep uh, saying that to me. Would you say that over, please? Uh, <laughs> And uh, I always have to say no, because if, when I try to say it over, it will come out differently, uh, because it's a, it's a statement of the moment. Uh, the idea is that uh, what, what humanity has, has always perceived as the life history of the gods, metaphysical reality, can now come to be perceived as the phenomenology of the objective psyche. Now, it's not possible uh, for those who are uh, still living out of the experience of metaphysical reality to make a sudden leap into the experience of psychological reality. Um, the analogy I think of is this. In, in Los Angeles, uh, I live on the ridge of a canyon. I can look out my window across the valley over to the ridge uh, on the opposite side. But unless I had very li large legs, I could not step across from the ridge I'm on, that I live on, to the ridge that I see on the other side where other houses are located. Instead, if, if I'm going to get to that ridge on the other side, I have to first go down through the valley. And this is how I perceive what's required for an individual to make the transition from a religious faith and the full awareness of uh, psychological reality. The only way he can reach that ridge on the other side, the ridge of psychological reality, is first of all to go down into the valley uh, that separates the two. And what that means uh, experientially is loss of faith. 
It means uh, going into, the, into a state of, of alienation, despair, loss of the sense of a meaningful universe, uh, uh, before he may have the chance to, to ascend the ridge on the other side. And my reading of the current collective situation is that a large number of people, in fact, the, uh, uh, what Toynbee called the creative minority of our civilization, uh, has, has lost its, uh, its secure dwelling place on the ridge of faith uh, and uh, is uh, somewhere in the midst of that uh, transit, hopefully to the, to the, new, to the new ridge. Um, and many don't make it. It's really an exceedingly uh, dangerous and precarious time for, for all concerned. However, uh, I'm speaking to an unknown audience, and uh, I have no way of knowing uh, uh, how many of you are in, in what situation. Uh, I do know that for those of you that are uh, safely perched on the ridge, uh, on the ridge of religious faith, uh, you have nothing to fear from what I say. Uh, there's nothing need to disturb you, because the psychological approach that uh, I'm going to present can be seen as an interesting addition or variant to the richer, more profound uh, experience uh, you already possess. So you're, you're absolutely safe if your faith is safe. Faith is enough, as Jung says someplace, if you have it, if it exists. That, of course, is the, is the catch of the matter. And uh, the trouble with the preachers, the preachers of faith, is they, uh, they neglect to, uh, to point out that faith cannot be willed. It's impossible to will faith. Uh, if you have it, you don't need to preach about it. You just quietly live it. And the, the more preachy you get, the more uh, doubt uh, comes up as to whether or not uh, you really have it. At least that's the psychological uh, observation we psychologists uh, tend to make. We owe an immense debt of gratitude uh, to, uh, to Jung, who has discovered the uh, reality of the psyche. Because for those who have uh, fallen off that secure ridge of faith, uh, the discovery of the psychological approach uh, can very well be life-saving. I have no hesitation uh, in, in my own conviction that it was life-saving for me. Uh, I don't think I could have survived if I had not, couldn't have survived psychologically, certainly, if I had not found a standpoint that uh, would meet all the requirements of my scientific conscience and still uh, enabled me to <clears throat> make a relation to the, to the archetypal realities that have always been enshrined uh, in, in religions. And I don't think I'm alone uh, in that situation. But if you're going to approach the psychological standpoint, uh, that very approach is an admission of bankruptcy on the level of, of religious faith. Jung puts it very explicitly. This comes from, uh, this is a quotation now, from paragraph 148 uh, in volume 11 of the Collected Works. Uh, it's his essay in Psychology and Religion. Jung says, I am not addressing myself to the happy possessors of faith, but to those many people for whom the light has gone out, the mystery has faded, and God is dead. For most of them, I should say that we can translate the phrase God is dead to mean that metaphysical reality is dead. That's the, it's the same, same thing. 
He continues, for most of them there is no going back, and one does not know either whether going back is the better way. To gain an understanding of religious matters, probably all that is left us today is the psychological approach. That is why I take these thought forms that have become historically fixed, try to melt them down again, and pour them into molds of immediate experience. Now let me speak more specifically about uh, the psychological approach to the Christian myth. As I first surveyed the territory, uh, knowing that I wanted to in invest, uh, investigate this uh, really nuclear, central myth of the Western psyche, uh, I reached the decision that uh, uh, using the New Testament narrative as the uh, immediate and primary uh, data uh, didn't seem quite suitable. I decided instead to order my studies and my presentations around the central or nodal images of Christianity that the collective psyche has crystallized out uh, in the course of centuries of uh, of experience as, um, as pictured especially uh, by uh, art. What I had in mind in particular uh, were the, uh, the images of the, uh, of the books of hours of the Middle Ages, uh, which we're now very fortunate to have a number of uh, beautiful reproductions of. That's, that's one of the... Uh, <coughs> optimistic uh, thoughts I had as a sort of a, what they call in these days, spin-off from the, from the more basic study. You know, in the Middle Ages, uh, various uh, artists and uh, uh, art studios were commissioned to, to produce uh, exceedingly beautiful and richly illustrated books of hours for, for royalty or nobility. One of the kinds, uh, and tremendous quantities of, of talent and effort were, uh, were poured, poured into, uh, into these unique single volumes for, for, the, for one person. Uh, little did those artists know that several centuries hence, means of uh, mass reproduction would allow their unique work of art to be duplicated in the hundreds of thousands and distributed across the, the earth. Uh, it's as though that, that isolated, unique, totally focused uh, artistic and personal uh, commitment to doing, doing the, the best job they could that uh, at the time would seem to, to uh, be benefiting only a single individual, the king or the, the Duke of Berry or someone of that sort, uh, through later developments has undergone a vast multiplicatio uh, and now can be appreciated uh, literally by millions. Uh, I think of this as a, as a paradigm. I'm spending some time on it because I think of it as a paradigm of uh, what can and indeed does happen when a single individual human being lives his own unique life in his own small setting, unknown to the wider world, with as much commitment as he's able to bring to it, and really does his very best to fulfill his individuation, as Jung means the term. I suspect that uh, living such a life will or does have something of the same uh, multiplying consequences 
that the artist who who made uh, a an individual book of ours uh, uh, experienced at a later time. Uh, anyway, I want to slip that in. That belongs to the symbol, the alchemical symbolism of multiplicatio. If you want to look it up. Anyway, as I was studying these books of ours and uh, the the artistic. Uh, um, response to the to the common faith of uh, of Western man in the middle Middle Ages, it became clear that uh, certain very specific images uh, crystallized out and and were the important ones. It's interesting that uh, practically all of Christ's ministry was uh, disregarded, uh, and instead, what one got was uh, certain uh, crucial. Uh, events in in the course of, of the life story. Um, one could choose a varying number of uh, such uh, uh, images. Uh, the ones I chose to give special folks attention to were uh, 16. Let me just read them chronologically so that you'll know what I consider to be the uh, the basic images of, um, of the Christian myth. The Annunciation, the Nativity, the flight into Egypt, the baptism, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the arrest and trial, mocking and flagellation of Christ, carrying the cross, the crucifixion, the deep position, lamentation, and entombment, resurrection and ascension, Pentecost, assumption of the Virgin Mary, and the last judgment. Now you will notice that the last three of those uh, do not even pertain to the life of Christ, specifically speaking, uh, but to take on a more general quality. Uh, As I studied these images and their sequence, it became clear to me that uh, what we're dealing with here is a cycle. And since uh, the material I present uh, uh, can, uh, can go into deta detailed byways so that you may lose the, the overall uh, basic core, uh, therefore I put at the very beginning this uh, chart. Um, that I think uh, summarizes, in essence, uh, what I'm calling the Christian archetype. I will talk some more about this chart in my last talk uh, tomorrow, but I want to present it to you now because the essence of my whole approach is right there. Uh, for purposes uh, of just uh, room, I have not put 16 different uh, uh, events in this cycle. I've, I've reduced it to eight, but the, num the number of events, that's arbitrary anyway, you understand. The point I want to make is that what we're dealing with here is a cycle, uh, and uh, the cyclic nature is, uh, is evident in the material itself if you're looking for it, as I hope to show you as we go along. And this is my uh, image and understanding of what I call the Christian archetype and uh, another, another term for the, for the same uh, psychic reality is the incarnation psyche, uh, cycle, which I will hope to make uh, more understandable uh, in, in the last uh, last talk. Now, let me uh, tell you what I have in store for you. Uh, right now I'm making my introductory remarks uh, about this subject matter, following which uh, I shall discuss the first image of this cycle, the Annunciation. Uh, 
This evening we will go to two other images in this cycle, namely uh, the baptism uh, and the second one I will concentrate on the uh, image of the agony in the garden as an example of the passion cycle. You can understand in this very brief time I, I have to be highly selective. Then tomorrow morning uh, I will talk about uh, resurrection and Pentecost. So that's, that's the sequence that I'm, I'm going to follow. In volume 11, paragraph 146, Jung says, What happens in the life of Christ happens always and everywhere. In the Christian archetype, all lives of this kind are prefigured. As you can see, that's where I got the phrase Christian archetype. I always feel more comfortable when I can face what I'm doing on Jung, uh, and uh, I can do it in this case. What it comes down to is uh, that the, uh, the Christian archetype is the root of the Western psyche. Uh, and when we examine this archetype, represented by the, the life of Christ, when we examine it as a prototype, we discover that the life of Christ pictures symbolically, in very rich and complex detail, the uh, process of individuation. When we talk about these matters, I'm, I'm reminded of, way, of the way the alchemists speak. Uh, the alchemists define one symbolic image in terms of another symbolic image uh, as, as if uh, they've settled the matter, you see, and everything's perfectly clear. Uh, but of course that's not quite the case, because when I speak of the uh, life of Christ as representing individuation, that's describing the unknown by the more unknown. And that's one of the principles of alchemical interpretation. I'm sorry about that, but uh, uh, it's the best we can do when we try to talk about something that cannot be rationally explicated. In other words, when, uh, when we are trying to evoke an experience which is beyond the ego's grasp, of intellectual or rational interpretation. Um, hopefully, as one talks in such a way, he constellates in the unconscious what he's talking about. And although the uh, ego may not understand it exactly, uh, very often the unconscious does. And the unconscious will say, yeah, right on, that's it. Uh, it reminds me of, a, of an anecdote I heard about Jung, that, uh, an experience that uh, pleased him very much. Uh, after uh, giving one of the Terry lectures in Yale in 1936, he was, he was walking out of the auditorium and he heard two people in front of him talking about the lecture and one said to the other, uh, I didn't understand a thing that man said, but he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> The unconscious broke in, you see, and uh, uh, announced its, uh, itself. Now, concerning, concerning uh, the Christian archetype, Jung has a very uh, uh, keen observation to, uh, to make about uh, how that is experienced uh, as long as uh, the image is completely contained within a church or religious creed. Uh, this remark is found in uh, paragraph 41 of Psychology and Alchemy. Uh, he says this, 
insofar as the archetypal content of the Christian drama was able to give satisfying expression to the uneasy and clamorous unconscious of the many, the consensus omnium raised this drama to a universally binding truth, not of course by an act of judgment, but by the irrational fact of possession, which is far more effective. Thus, Jesus became the tutelary image or amulet against the archetypal powers that threatened to possess everyone. The glad tidings announced, it has happened, but it will not happen to you inasmuch as you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yet it could and can and will happen to everyone in whom the Christian dominant has decayed. You see there, the, the critical sentence is, it can and it will happen to everyone in whom the Christian dominant has decayed. In other words, when the use of the Christian imagery as an amulet, as a protective amulet, uh, no longer works, then, then the individual is exposed to the, to the direct experience. As one studies alchemy, and as Jung studied it, uh, it's discovered that uh, to a large extent the imagery that belongs to the, to the Christian sequence reappears uh, in, in alchemy in a different context, in a different setting. In other words, the philosopher's stone that is uh, the, the goal of the alchemical process uh, is in many respects parallel uh, to Christ. And uh, the ordeal that the materia in the vessel must go through uh, in order to become the philosopher's stone is often uh, analogized uh, as corresponding to the sufferings that Christ had to go through. Jung makes clear that uh, this uh, parallelism is not consciously derived. It's not simply a substitution of the Christian imagery uh, uh, put into the alchemical uh, context, but rather it's the fact that the same archetype is constellated in the alchemical transformation process as is at the root of the Christian myth. And therefore, the images are bound to be of a similar nature. Paragraph uh, 492 of Mysterium Conjunctionis goes into this matter. Jung speaks of the Christ image that is activated in the alchemical process, and he says, um, it is not an effort or an intentional straining after imitation of Christ, but rather an involuntary experience of the reality represented by the sacred legend. This reality comes upon him in his work just as the stigmata come to the saints without their being consciously sought. The passion that vibrates in our text corresponds to the real experience of a man who has got involved in the compensatory contents of the unconscious by investigating the unknown seriously and to the point of self-sacrifice. He could not but see the likeness of his projected contents to the dogmatic images. He might have been tempted to assume that his ideas were nothing else than the familiar religious conceptions which he was using in order to explain the chemical procedures. But the texts show clearly that on the contrary, a real experience of the opus had an increasing tendency to assimilate the dogma or to amplify itself with it. 
In other words, this idea, here's the crux, the crux of it. A real experience of the opus had a tendency to assimilate the dogma. Now the same thing comes up in the course of the, of the psychological uh, opus. Uh, I think the really crucial issue uh, of uh, the modern mind is whether uh, the church is going to be able to assimilate Jungian psychology or whether Jungian psychology is going to assimilate uh, not the church that would be indigestible with all the stones <laughs> uh, but the imagery that the church rests on uh, this is no this will not be settled by by any matter of opinion it will be settled by profound organic realities in the sea the big fish swallows the little fish that's that's the rule of life and whichever is larger is going to swallow the smaller one it's not quite clear which is which my personal opinion is that Jungian psychology is going to swallow the religious imagery but I can be wrong about that but that is the issue when we're talking about assimilation we're talking about swallowing and uh, uh, since uh, what we're dealing with is the basic of the basic stuff of psychic existence if the if the Western psyche is going to survive and that uh, I really think it is uh, then uh, it has to uh, it has to be grounded on on whatever its basic uh, foundation is and uh, psychologically what we're talking about here today uh, is its ground its uh, its foundation matter and uh, it has to be in contact with that foundation matter in some kind of form in some kind of contained context uh, if it's to survive now those are my introductory remarks to uh, to these nodal images that, that go to make up uh, what I call the, the Christian archetype and what I want to do now is uh, examine briefly uh, several of these images to give you something of the feel of uh, what these images look like uh, when they're examined psychologically as uh, contrasted with their more familiar uh, uh, religious uh, formulations. <coughs> Let's talk about the Annunciation. The only account of the Annunciation is found in the first chapter of Luke. <clears throat> I'm going to read you the relevant passage. Uh, the translation I use uh, is the Jerusalem translation. Um, no translation is quite ideal, but uh, I like it a little better than the others, but I won't argue with anybody that prefers another one. Uh, anyway, that's what I'm using. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He went in and said to her, Rejoice, so highly favored, the Lord is with you. She was deeply disturbed by these words and asked herself what this greeting could mean. But the angel said to her, Mary, do not be afraid. You have won God's favor. Listen, you are to conceive and bear a child, bear a son, and you must name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will have no end. <coughs> Mary said to the angel, But how can this come about, since I am a virgin? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel answered, and the power of the Most High will cover you with its shadow. And so the child will be holy and will be called Son of God. Know, know this too, your kinswoman Elizabeth has in her old age herself conceived a son, and she whom people called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible to God. 
I am the handmaid of the Lord, said Mary. Let what you have said be done to me. And the angel left her. This is probably the uh, most frequently painted and represented uh, image in the whole sequence of Christ's life, so far as the medieval material is concerned. The image of the, of the Annunciation. And that means, of course, that uh, it is a profoundly relevant archetypal image for the collective psyche. The, the fact that uh, it should, uh, should exhibit such fascination. Uh, and indeed it is. Um, put with uh, brevity, it symbolizes the soul's impregnating encounter with the self. It's a moment of immense danger and ambigu ambiguity. That's only hinted at in the text, but it's made more visible in some of the legendary <coughs> material. Uh, in the Jerusalem translation, what we read is that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and <clears throat> the power of the Most High will cover you with its shadow. Well, that doesn't sound particularly pleasant, as, as a matter of fact. Uh, it has uh, certain, uh, certain correspondences to, uh, to how a little newborn chick might feel if the shadow of a hawk's wing were suddenly to, uh, uh, to overshadow it. You know, uh, there's an instinct built into the newborn's chick. They don't, they don't learn this by, uh, by teaching from their mother. If a shadow crosses their path, they flee. A newborn chicken knows that. It, it's building, it's, it's part of the archetypal reality of the chick's psyche. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of image that is uh, uh, represented here. Uh, the basic word, uh, overshadow, epischiazo, refers to being enveloped in the shadow of a, of a cloud. Uh, and uh, it brings into consideration uh, the whole rich symbolism of the cloud. Just to put it briefly, uh, the, cloud, the cloud symbolizes God. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, in the Old Testament material, uh, God manifested himself uh, in a cloud, among other ways. But uh, a pillar of cloud was, uh, was a, uh, an instrument of guidance, and when he inhabited his uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, and when he, when he came to inhabit the tabernacle that Solomon built, he came as a cloud. Um, for instance, we read in Exodus, uh, when he, came, when he came to Moses, he came in the cloud. The cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of Yahweh settled on the mountain. And for six days the cloud covered it. Uh, so what, what is indicated is that Mary allows the cloud of Yahweh to rest on her. And in the course of allowing that to happen, she makes herself synonymous both with the holy tabernacle in the wilderness, in which the, where the, ta the cloud rested, and also with Solomon's temple. And the, uh, the church fathers uh, made a great deal of this uh, equation between uh, Mary offering herself as a dwelling place of Yahweh and the Ark of the Covenant, which was also uh, the dwelling place. Uh, so that uh, the idea then is that uh, 
the, at the beginning of the Christian archetype, uh, at the beginning of the incarnation cycle, comes a willingness to allow the cloud of the transpersonal reality to rest on one and incarnate and come into manifestation in one's own life. And this is as likely to be a dark experience uh, as it is to be a bright one. Um, for example, in some of the apocryphal material, uh, we, we read that at the time of uh, the birth of Christ, which is said uh, in the apocryphal material to, to take place in a cave, a black cloud uh, overshadowed the cave at the moment of, of birth. And this was unfollowed by great light. But uh, the whole theme of the black cloud, that comes up very prominently in alchemy, and it's an image of the nigrado. Nigrado, the darkness, that's just a fancy Latin word for, for the darkening process, uh, which is a kind of technical term in, in alchemy. The black cloud in alchemy is an image of the nigrado, nigrado the, the dark night of the soul, the state of, of despair, depression, and uh, uh, defeat. Now I must bring you some, some more personal material to give you a real feeling of what the Annunciation means when it's uh, when it's considered psychologically rather than dogmatically. Uh, it means from the, from the images I've been alluding to that uh, uh, the self, which is a union of opposites, is, uh, is asking to be manifest in, in the, the, the human life and that means then that that human life will be exposed to the opposites because the self is a union of opposites. Let me give you an example of that. A woman who had had surgery for malignant melanoma with an apparent cure had this dream. I'm standing on flat grassy ground a small woodland creature runs through my legs. I think it was a squirrel. Suddenly I am lifted up by a great black cloud off the ground and held there, cradled by the cloud, underneath the branches of a great tree. I'm absolutely terrified and scream for help. No one comes. Eventually I'm brought down again to earth. I'm shaken reach out and touch my cat and say, so this is God. A few months later, the same person had this dream. The great black cloud has come again. It's terrible. I can't handle it. Then a voice comes and says, I can handle it. I say, no, I can't. The voice says, yes, you can. <laughs> the next day, following this dream, the dreamer learned that her most beloved brother had been killed in a plane crash the night before. And this event initiated uh, a deep depression that lasted for uh, several months. The deep depression being the black cloud that um, uh, engulfed her. But then out of that agonizing experience, a whole new level of development took place. This woman is now a Jungian analyst. <laughs> These dreams give you some idea of what being overshadowed by the Most High can mean experientially. 
It's this personal concrete aspect of the Annunciation experience that the human being, Mary, must have lived and which is left out of account in the Gospel text. And I think the time has come <coughs> to uh, acknowledge this aspect of the image and thereby humanize it. And in the course of humanizing it, uh, we are doing on another level the very thing that the image of Mary uh, is doing in the symbolic sequence, if you follow me. say a word about uh, Mary as virgin. Brings up the whole question as to what psychological virginity is. Esther Harding has some interesting remarks on that subject, which I don't have time to go into, but uh, if you're interested, you can look it up in Woman's Mysteries, page 124 and the following. But this is an archetypal image, the theme of a virgin impregnated by God or by the Son. And uh, I... One can gather other examples of it from Fraser's Golden Bough. Again, I don't have time to go into the particulars. But it's, uh, it's part of the, of the traditional symbolism that virgins were used as caretakers of the sacred flame. The outstanding example of that was the sacred flame of ancient Rome that was tended by the Vestal Virgins. But uh, there are similar examples of the archetype uh, uh, other places too, such as among the Incas of Peru. Uh, there seems to be an archetypal connection between symbolic virginity and the ability to handle transpersonal energy, which is what I would understand the sacred flame to represent. Um, now what does that mean? Uh, the whole question is, here we are, we're interpreting one symbolic image by another symbolic image. Psychological virginity, what's that? Well, um, I think it means that the ego is clean enough to relate to transpersonal energies without being blasted by them. Um, Philo, for instance, wrote, that was uh, the, Neo, the, the Jewish Neoplatonist of the, of the first century. He wrote, for the Congress of men for the procreation of children makes virgins women. But when God begins to associate with the soul, he brings to pass that she who was formerly woman becomes virgin again. I think John Donne expresses the, uh, uh, something of the same sort of thing in this uh, paradoxical nature of symbolic chastity uh, in, in number 14 of his Holy Sonnets, uh, which reads as follows. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but owe to no end. 
Reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved, fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free. And here's the punchline. Nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. So it's as though uh, Yahweh, or in, in the, uh, in the uh, New Testament image, the, the Holy Ghost, uh, won't have Congress with a woman unless she's a virgin. That's, that's sort of the archetypal idea. Yeah, that uh, Men used to, used to be possessed by that same archetype, you know, that they wouldn't marry a woman unless she were a virgin. It's, uh, that's, that's not appropriate. Much better to have a woman with experience. That, that's, not, that's not appropriate concretely. But it's the archetypal reality that's being expressed. There you see. But, so what you have to inquire at to understand this psychologically is what is psychological virginity? And we don't exhaust the answers uh, just by certain uh, formulas or, or intellectual statements about it, because fundamentally we're dealing with uh, symbols that uh, transcend uh, the intellectual capacity to, to grasp entirely. But uh, it really does enrich one's life to carry ideas like that around and ask yourself every now and then, what is psychological virginity? And you see, this is, uh, this is the sort of thing that's generated if you pay attention to the, these fascinating images that go to make up the Christian archetype. Uh, you start asking questions as to what they mean and how they apply to, to your individual life. And as you do that, uh, you very gradually are drawn in to the incarnation process, whatever that means. Mary's classic response to the Annunciation is, is the ultimate example of submission to God's will. I wonder how many thousand sermons have been preached on, on that uh, subject. She says, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done to me. More, more literally, uh, the translators do euphemize in their translation. They really do. It really ought to be translated, I'm the slave girl of the Lord. And somehow that's got a different quality to it. <clears throat> Mary's obedience to God, represented by that phrase, uh, is often contrasted with Eve's disobedience. And the connection between these two events, between uh, Mary's response to the Holy Ghost and Eve's, well, Eve's response to the serpent, uh, bring up a very interesting psychological connection. Uh, and this connection is, uh, is made explicit in, not, not infrequently, in medieval paintings. Uh, I have several examples. Uh, in which uh, the Annunciation uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the Virgin by, by the ancient Gabriel is in the foreground. And in the upper left half uh, corner of the picture is, is an image of uh, uh, Adam and Eve being uh, ejected from the Garden of Eden, uh, or in some cases uh, by... Uh, by Eve's accepting the, uh, the apple from the serpent. These unusual pictures link quite explicitly uh, the, t the, two, uh, the two events. Uh, and in, in certain examples, uh, Yahweh, as a dark-winged deity, is hovering over Adam and Eve as they're being banished from the, from the garden, so that we have the, 
overshadowing image expressed quite explicitly. So in both cases what we have is that a human being is being overshadowed by the cloud of, of God. Uh, Paul, you know, connects Christ and Adam when he says uh, death came through one man and in the same way the resurrection of the dead has come through one man. Just as all men die in Adam, so all men will be brought to life in Christ. Uh, and likewise, uh, Mary has been uh, linked with, with Eve. As she's, uh, Eve was the bad one and Mary is the good one. Uh, in an apocryphal book called the Protoevangelium of James, uh, when Jesus first hears of Mary's pregnancy, this is what he says. Who has done this evil in my house and defiled her, meaning the virgin? Has the story of Adam been repeated in me? For as Adam was absent in the hour of his prayer, and the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her and defiled her, so also has it happened to me. Uh, Gregory Thaumaturgist says, uh, an angel talks with the virgin in order that the serpent may no more have converse with the woman. These passages all consider that the fall of man through Eve's disobedience and the conception of Christ through Mary's obedience to be parallel but opposite happenings. What the two events signify psychologically must therefore be closely related. We know psychologically that uh, when the self is activated, <coughs> uh, the opposites uh, are constellated. And uh, therefore, uh, whenever one uh, encounters a one-sided attitude of, of any sort uh, in, in consciousness, one is on the lookout for uh, its opposite in the unconscious. Uh, and this, in fact, is what we perceive in this material, you, s you see, uh, because this is the material of the collective psyche. This is the uh, incredible uh, um, capacity of Jung to be able to take the whole cultural evolution of the human race as a case history. That's what he did. And that's what we're trying to do in a, in a smaller way as, as we review the, uh, the data of the, uh, of the collective psyche in the way, uh, the way it expressed itself artistically in the myth of Christ, just as we would examine the, uh, the paintings of an individual patient to see what they tell us, you see. This is the, the patient Western man and the way his unconscious expressed itself. And the way it did it uh, was by, by this intense uh, fascination with the, uh, with the image of the Virgin Mary, especially uh, uh, at the point of her uh, accepting the announcement of the, of, the, of the angel and opening herself up to be the slave girl of Yahweh. But then what we, f what we find on the margins of the material is uh, Eve, her sister, her dark sister, who is supposed to have done just the reverse, you see. But then that gets us to reflecting. Well, now, what about this? Uh, Eve was disobedient, yes. Uh, she was told not to uh, eat the fruit, but she was obedient to the serpent. So um, then things get a little ambiguous, 
you see. And it's that amb ambiguity that knocks one off the ridge of faith and down into, into, the, into the dark valley if, if you start thinking about these things seriously. Anyway, my suggestion is that the expulsion from the Garden of Eden and the enunciation of the conception of Christ are two different expressions for the same thing. Or to put it even more baldly, that Eve's obedience to the serpent and Mary's obedience to the angel Gabriel are essentially the same event. Now, in order for us not just to descend into chaos uh, when we start making such equations, uh, we, uh, we have to uh, elaborate it a bit. Uh, so I would have to add the, the phrase at different stages of development, they are the same event. Uh, in other words, uh, the event of the Garden of Eden, which led to the expulsion, belongs to an earlier stage of, of ego development in which a necessary uh, crime is committed uh, in, in order for consciousness to be, to be born, but at the price of, uh, of suffering. And then at a later stage uh, of uh, development, um, it takes on the opposite cast. I know that raises more questions than it answers. Probably doesn't answer any questions at all. But uh, um, that's all right. Just another example or two of uh, how people have uh, responded to this uh, profound and complex image of the Annunciation. Uh, the evidence that it is an archetypal image uh, is provided by the fact that it, it's, uh, uh, that it carries this universal fascination and that uh, uh, the, uh, the deepest artists and, and thinkers uh, are, are gripped by it and try to give it again and again uh, new, new facets of meaning. For example, the, uh, the medieval uh, theologian Hugh St. Victor writes this, The motive for a conception, according to nature, is the love of a man for a woman, and of a woman for a man. And therefore, since a singular love of Holy Spirit burned in the Virgin's heart, the love of the Holy Spirit wrought great things in her flesh. Now this passage concerning love as the operative agent must be uh, followed by another one uh, from Hugh St. Victor that explains what he means. This is uh, an apostrophe to the power of, of love as, uh, as the operative agent in the Virgin's heart. He says, you have great power, O love. You alone could draw God down from heaven to earth. O oh, how strong is your bond with which even God could be bound. You brought him bound with your bonds. You brought him wounded with your arrows. You wounded him who was invulnerable. You bound him who was invincible. You drew down him who was immovable. The eternal you made mortal. O oh, love, how great is your victory. That's an image of the power of the image of Annunciation. Psychologically, we might say that Mary's uh, obedience or love is an expression of her willingness to face the numinosum, to allow herself to be affected by it, 
and therefore to bring it into reality, that is to, to incarnate it, to give it a, an earthly dwelling place. W. B. Yeats has a poem on this uh, subject of the Annunciation. The title of it is The Mother of God. He's a contemporary, you know. He, he died just the other day, a few decades ago, but uh, uh, this, was, this, was, uh, this was written in 1922, so he, he belongs to, to us, to our, our generation of uh, psychological understanding. The threefold terror of love, a fallen flare through the hollow of an ear, wings beating about the room, the terror of all terrors that I bore the heavens in my womb. Had I not found content among the shows every common woman knows, chimney corner, garden walk, or rocky cistern where we tread the clothes and gather all the talk? What is this flesh I purchased with my pains, this fallen star my milk sustains, this love that makes my heart blood stop or strikes a sudden chill into my bones and bids my hair stand up? That's as clear as a formulation by Jung. <laughs> but the Annunciation is an encounter with the Numinosum. It's the same thing. Let me end with some verses by Angelus Salesius. He was someone that was young with fond of. He quotes this in Mysterium Conjunctionis in paragraph 444. This is an English translation. His, his uh, verses were in German, but they're, it's, it's reasonably accurate. If by God's Holy Ghost thou art beguiled, there will be born in thee the eternal child. If it's like Mary, virginal and pure, then God will impregnate your soul, for sure. God make me pregnant, and his spirit shadow me, that God may rise up in my soul and shelter me. What good does Gabriel's Ave Mary do unless he give me that same greeting too? I want to remind you, and particularly myself, of um, my basic procedure uh, in dealing with this material, which is to work from specific images. On other occasions when I've given some of this material, I have uh, used slides of uh, the images as they occurred in books of ours. Uh, it didn't seem like a, a practical thing to do uh, to use slides here, so I left them home. But uh, I want to remind us all that uh, I am talking about images, uh, actual pictures, as they, uh, uh, as they manifested themselves in, in the history of, uh, of Western art. And with that reminder, I hope I'll remember to describe tonight, uh, a little more specifically, the, the nature of the painted images that, uh, that I'm talking about. This morning, we started with the first image in this cycle, number one, the Annunciation, and now we are proceeding around the, uh, the circle. 
Uh, we are skipping the nativity, which is a very major image, of course. Uh, and uh, the next one on our agenda is uh, the baptism of Christ. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the conventional picture of the baptism of Christ. Uh, incidentally, uh, if any of you are so inclined to uh, to look in more more fully to to the, to the medieval books of ours, uh, the one I suggest you start with, which uh, really was the first of the series uh, uh, to be reproduced in in recent years, and in many respects is still the best, and best of all, still in print. Uh, and that's the Hours of Catherine of Cleves, that's published by George Brazeller. Uh, it's an art book, and it costs, I don't know the exact sum now, somewhere between 30 and 40 dollars, but uh, it's worth it. And uh, it's, it really offers you an excellent opportunity to, uh, to reflect on the, the images I'm talking about. And the, uh, one of the big advantages of, of pictures is they speak directly to the unconscious, and they keep one from getting too heady. The baptism of Christ, uh, the, the characteristic conventional image, is of a central figure, Christ standing in the River Jordan, uh, and John, uh, often John the Baptist, uh, may be standing in the river with him, or he may be standing on the, on the right bank of the river, uh, very often pouring water over his uh, head. Uh, and on the left side of the, of the bank of the river, usually, uh, uh, conventionally, are uh, two angels who are holding Christ's garments. Uh, and from above, the, the dove of the Holy Spirit uh, is descending uh, on Christ as he's being baptized, and rays of light almost always uh, accompany the image of the, of the dove of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, radi radiating a certain luminosity uh, onto the, uh, the head of Christ. That's, that's the uh, traditional image. There are variations of it, but uh, that's, the, that's the typical one. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a basic image. I, I don't think there are any books of ours that I've come across that haven't included that, that particular image. It's uh, uh, very widespread. Uh, one painter's uh, representation of this scene, uh, I reproduce an ego and archetype. The image derives from Matthew 3.13. At least that's one I'm going to read. You, you find parallel accounts in, in Mark and Luke. <coughs> Uh, and it reads as follows. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. But John stopped him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus, however, answered him, Permit it for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Thereupon he, John, allowed him to be baptized. When Jesus had been baptized, he went up immediately out of the water, and see, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and alighting on him. Then came a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, the Beloved One, with whom I am well pleased. I should also mention a very common variant to the, uh, to the uh, image of the literal baptism. Uh, and in that variant, uh, the picture shows John the Baptist dressed in his, uh, his hair garments, uh, since he was an anchorite in the desert, holding Christ pictured as a lamb in his arms with a halo around his uh, uh, head. And this particular image comes from John 1, 
29, where we read, The next day, seeing Jesus coming towards him, John said, Look, there is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That particular reference uh, uh, alludes to the fact that uh, Christ is specifically identified with the Passover lamb of Exodus. That's the, uh, that's the lamb uh, who was, that was sacrificed uh, um, before the, the Passover and whose blood was uh, uh, placed on the, uh, on the doorposts in order to spare the Israelites from the avenging angel who, who came to uh, slaughter the firstborn of the Egyptians. Um, not only is, is Christ therefore the Passover lamb, he's also uh, associated with the exp uh, expiatory sacrifice that one uh, reads about in Leviticus, uh, a purification ritual that involves the sacrifice of a lamb. Here the purification ritual applies to the whole world, to the sins of the whole world, you see, and uh, uh, Christ as a voluntary sacrificial victim purifies the whole world. Um, this sort of parallel, as I'm sure you, you well know, of the of the New Testament events with, with the Old Testament prefigurations uh, is, uh, is a recurrent theme uh, in the New Testament, especially in Matthew, and uh, is very important in understanding that the uh, symbolic imagery of uh, the two divisions of the Bible uh, are absolutely continuous and, and belong to each other. Christ's baptism is a uh, prototype uh, of the sacrament or the ritual of baptism in the, in the church, which marks the entry uh, into the church. Uh, looked at psychologically, it's a salutio initiation ordeal that symbolizes death and rebirth, representing the death of the old life of the flesh uh, and a rebirth into the new life of Christ uh, and uh, the eternal life that he promises. You know, in, in the original uh, baptism ritual, it was meant to simulate drowning, literal drowning, and therefore total immersion was, uh, was used in, in the early church. The Old Testament prototypes to this image were Noah's flood, in which only eight people survived, hence the symbolism of the number eight, hence the reason that the medieval baptistries were octagonal, and uh, also the passage through the Red Sea in which the Israelites escaped the pursuing Egyptians. Um, that's also used by the church fathers as a uh, anti-type or uh, foreshadowing, I should say, of the uh, uh, of Christ's baptism. Another way of putting it would be that his baptism symbolizes his vocational initiation. He here encounters his destined work. And this is, this is the implication of such imagery in, in modern, modern material. Um, It's one of the most important nodal points in the whole drama. The Gospel of Mark begins with baptism. It doesn't even bother to, to speak of the Annunciation or the Nativity. Uh, also, when we, when we look at the text carefully, it's clear that Christ was initially a follower of John the Baptist. And in allowing himself by John, what he's doing is submitting himself to immersion in the unconscious under the guidance of another. And this then led him to an experience of the autonomous psyche 
represented by the descent of the Holy Ghost. I think something very similar may happen when an analysand submits himself to a personal analysis and to whatever transference may emerge to the, to the analyst in the analytic process. Uh, it's as though he's allowing himself to be baptized by another. He's putting himself in the hands of another. And if the, if the other drops him in the water, the, the imagery anyway is that he could drown. But if a prospective analysand uh, submits to such a procedure, what can then happen is that uh, although initially a personal dependence uh, develops, uh, that can then lead later to an encounter with the autonomous objective psyche, which uh, resolves the personal dependence uh, and gives the individual uh, an immediate individual relation to, uh, to his own depths. This explanation for Christ's willingness to submit to, to baptism by John is contained in the enigmatic phrase, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. That's why he says to John, he should go ahead and do it, to fulfill all righteousness. I have gathered together uh, different translations of this, uh, of this phrase uh, just to see if I could get some different angles to it. That's what the authorized version says, to fulfill all righteousness. The Douay says to fulfill all justice. The New English Bible says to conform with all that, that God requires. The New American Bible to fulfill all of God's demands. Um, another one, do all that God requires, and another to meet all the law's demands. If I try to extract the psychological meaning of this phrase, the idea that it leads me to is that to follow what is just, right, and required by God means that one must at some point submit himself to the authority of another before he can, ex he can safely experience the transpersonal other from within. And I think that is indeed the case, that uh, one must serve an apprenticeship, a psychological apprenticeship, first. Uh, and uh, that way, the uh, encounter with the autonomous transpersonal spirit is mediated, humanized, and uh, uh, connected with the human community. Uh, in a way that uh, uh, it isn't if, if there is no such uh, step of apprenticeship. You know, it's very interesting as, as one uh, delves into the, uh, to the various associated images that have uh, accumulated uh, around the, uh, the central symbol, uh, the various images elaborate uh, psychological aspects one wouldn't otherwise think of. For instance, according to the Docetist heresy, um, there were two baptisms. Not one, but two. And um, the one baptism was the baptism that uh, John the Baptist performed on Christ and the other baptism was the descent of the Holy Spirit, the baptism by the Holy Spirit, uh, and that it was that second baptism uh, that uh, Christ referred to when he said, I, I have another baptism to uh, be baptized with, and I hasten eagerly toward it. Um, this corresponds psychologically, uh, I think, to the personal dimension of uh, what we might call the baptism of confession administered by another, which would be part of the uh, personal transference in, in an analysis, uh, in which one finds that uh, the uh, confession of 
one's guilty complexes uh, give one a, a profound sense of relief, being able to share them with the, someone who can stand them and not condemn you uh, for it. Uh, and that then is, is the type of thing that uh, uh, generates the personal transference. That would be the first uh, baptism. That's the baptism of repentance, so to speak, that, uh, that corresponding to what John administers. But the second baptism is the baptism of the encounter with the autonomous psyche, corresponding to the Holy Ghost, in which one becomes aware that the important thing is not what the analyst thinks of you. Who cares? He's just another hum human being like you. That isn't what matters. What matters is the realization that one must answer to the self. And the experience of that uh, autonomous factor in the psyche, then, is the second baptism. And uh, that resolves whatever personal transference may exist. And I think we have an example of, of that uh, double uh, sequence uh, in the uh, imagery of Christ's baptism. So many interesting things are associated in the legendary and apocryphal material with, with the baptism of Christ. For instance, several texts mention the presence uh, or the manifestation, the appearance of fire over the Jordan at the time of Christ's baptism. Um, one, one commentator informs us uh, after uh, quoting such a, uh, such a text, that the fire surely refers to the Shekinah that probably attended the descent of the Holy Spirit. The Shekinah is the, is the glory of Yahweh. Uh, and other texts speak of the uh, manifestation of light associated with the, the baptism. So here we have dove, fire, and light, all belonging to the same image. But then the scripture itself gives us another feature, most important feature, namely <clears throat> the voice from heaven. So we have dove, fire, light, and voice as all belonging to the same image. This voice from heaven occurs uh, three times with Christ. Uh, the baptism is the first time it occurs. It also occurs at the time of the Transfiguration in the 17th chapter of Matthew, uh, where we read that suddenly a bright cloud covered them with shadow, and from the cloud there came a voice which said, This is my Son, the Beloved. He enjoys my favor. Listen to him. It's practically identical mes message, you see. And then the third time is before the Passion in the 12th chapter of John, where Christ says, Father, glorify your name, and a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. I make a special point of this uh, image of the voice from heaven because it's something that shows up in dreams. Um, and. Uh, it's always a very important occurrence when, it, when it, the authoritative voice appears. And it's, it's the voice of the self, and it must always be treated with the utmost respect. If you're interested, uh, Jung refers to this ph phenomenon in psychology and alchemy in two places, in paragraph 115 and in paragraph 294. At his baptism, the voice announces to Christ, This is my son, the beloved one, with whom I am well pleased. And essentially the same thing is said at the transformation. Now, what does that mean? This is the question we must put to, uh, to these images again and again. What does this mean psychologically? It really astonishes me. The more I work on it, how these images have been uh, meditated upon 
and uh, worshipped and carried around with uh, millions of people uh, for all these centuries. And um, the question would never get asked, what does this mean? What does it mean that these images are so powerful that they grip us and that we live by them? Uh, what do they mean? That question, of course, had to wait the, uh, the birth of uh, the psychological standpoint, uh, and therefore it couldn't happen any sooner. But uh, uh, once, once the question comes, uh, one wonders, uh, why hasn't it been asked sooner? Anyhow, uh, that's the question we must put to ourselves now. What, what does this voice mean coming at this particular time that uh, Christ has submitted himself to baptism by John? I think it suggests that Christ, as an embodiment or representation of uh, an ego in the act of individuating has the love, support, and commendation of the self. And this comes specifically at the moment that he accepts his destiny and takes on his vocation by a willing descent into the unconscious, because that's the image. He, he descends into the, into the water uh, supported by, by someone else. So at, at that moment that he commits himself to that descent into the unconscious, he has the experience of being justified. Uh, and that justification establishes the connection with, with the transpersonal, with, with the Heavenly Father, uh, the connecting uh, link being represented by the, by the dove. So that symbolically we can think of Christ's descent into the water of baptism uh, as a kind of calling down the descent of the Holy Spirit from heaven. As he descends into the water, uh, the Holy Spirit of heaven uh, descends onto him. Now the term beloved one links Christ with the suffering servant of Yahweh as depicted in Isaiah 42, where, where we read, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have endowed him with my spirit that he may bring true justice to the nation. The baptism is almost an exact uh, portrait of that account because the en endowment of with Yahweh's spirit is pictured by the descent of the of the dove. In some of the early uh, patristic texts, Christ's descent into the Jordan was described as an, an heroic encounter with the demons of darkness. That would correspond to our psychological understanding of it as a descent into the unconscious. For instance, Since therefore it was necessary to break the heads of the dragon in pieces, he went down and bound the strong one in the waters. This theme of the dragon hidden in the waters of death and of Christ's baptism as a descent into the dragon's domain was to endure in tradition, as the commentator uh, John Dan Danielou uh, says. So it's as though as he allows himself to be baptized, he, uh, he permits himself to have an encounter with, uh, uh, with the uh, 
the dragon that existed uh, in the waters. There's another uh, related idea that's uh, also found in the patristic writings. Uh, Ignatius writes, Our God, Jesus the Christ, was born and was baptized that by his passion he might cleanse water. And there's another closely related conception of that sort from um, Clement of Alexandria, who writes, The Lord had himself baptized, that not that he had need of it for himself, but so that he might sanctify all water for those that are regenerated in it. In this way, not only are our bodies cleansed, but our souls also and the sanctification of the invisible parts of our being is signified by the fact that even the impure spirits which cleave to our soul are rooted out from the time of the new spiritual birth. This, I think, is a really remarkable symbolic idea when you reflect on its psychological meaning. Christ, by submitting to baptism, cleansed water and purified it of the demons that naturally inhabit it. Now, what does that mean psychologically? We who uh, work in analysis uh, and with the uh, unconscious certainly know for certain that water, the commonest image for the unconscious, is inhabited by demons. What are demons? We have to ask everything. Can't take anything for granted. Demons are autonomous complexes with archetypal cores, as all complexes have. But uh, anyway, they're, they're autonomous, uh, dissociated, partial personalities that inhabit the unconscious. Uh, I assure you, they really do. And the, the idea that the unconscious could be purified of demons uh, is, uh, is an astonishing one. But as one reflects on it, uh, in relation to, to psychological experience, uh, one can begin to perceive what's referred to in this symbolism. You see, uh, in the ordinary state of the human ego, uh, one must be uh, constantly on guard for what comes out of them spontaneously. Uh, because the old Adam comes out of them spontaneously. The, uh, the unregenerate, uh, unconscious, filled with demons and filled with primitive desirousness and uh, uh, destructive and uh, self-centered, self-serving and uh, uh, potentially uh, negative and dangerous entities. Uh, so that uh, uh, a good part, part of our uh, early education, our psychological education, is to teach us to uh, be on guard of um, from uh, what's in us uh, spontaneously, for good reason, because uh, the, the, original, um, the original organism is, uh, is not innocent. Uh, Freud is really right about, uh, about that, that the, uh, the child is, uh, is uh, on his terrible word, polymorphous perversity. But uh, the fact is that the, uh, the, un the unconscious, the, the realm of water, is indeed uh, the dwelling place of demons. But what we do discover, that with a long process of, of analysis, very dil diligently applied, uh, which, which involves uh, prolonged scrutiny of the shadow aspect of our spontaneity, the demonic aspect of our spontaneity, uh, that prolonged period of baptism does bring about, as a consequence, hopefully and at least partially, in, 
in some cases, uh, a purification of the unconscious or uh, a de demonization of the spontaneous aspect of the uh, uh, of the psyche that makes it safe to be spontaneous uh, once again and with with that uh, comes the the prospect of a certain amount of wholeness you see because you can't be whole uh, as long as you have to scrutinize uh, everything that's going on in the unconscious to check the shadow uh, from coming out inappropriately uh, this corresponds very much to uh, the uh, the image of <coughs> the um, the fairy tale of the um, spirit in the bottle. This is the fairy tale that uh, Jung starts out his essay on Spirit Mercurius with. Uh, the story is that the uh, a bottle was found that uh, that had locked up the Spirit Mercurius for two thousand years. A woodcutter's son found it. He opened the bottle, and the spirit rushed out. And the first thing it did was it. Uh, started to murder him, started choking him. And fortunately, he was clever enough, he got him back in the bottle and uh, by trickery, and uh, then, he, then he got to uh, negotiate with him. And then when he let him out the set, second time, he was more amenable. Uh, in other words, that spirit in the bottle corresponds to the state of the unconscious in its original condition, and in its unpure, demonized condition, so to speak. And uh, um, it has to, uh, the unconscious itself, through being worked on, has to uh, undergo a purification before the spontaneous principle uh, dare to be let out into the, into the general world. And uh, all this, I think, is, uh, is what's symbolized by these patristic uh, images that when Christ... Uh, submitted to, uh, to baptism, to the descent into the unconscious, uh, he, uh, he purified the water, the, demo the water that was uh, the dwelling place of demons. And it's one of the consequences then of, of achieving some, some degree of totality that uh, the unconscious becomes uh, purified. I think the basic uh, psychological idea in this image of uh, the baptism is uh, that it's an expression of an individual's confrontation with his vocation. His psychological vocation, uh, which is also his destiny, of course. What he's, what, he's, what he's supposed to do, what he's meant to do. And there, there are certain representations of, of the baptism that are particularly impression, uh, impressive. I'm thinking of one uh, that's, that's in the, uh, the Grand du Jour of, of the Duke of Berry that's published. It's a, it's a great, great big volume about this size and uh, magnificently illuminated. And the picture of the... Um, baptism is somewhat unusual in that the dove, the descending dove of the Holy Ghost is a, is a great giant bird uh, with extended wings that occupies the whole upper portion of the uh, picture. Uh, I mention that particular picture because it uh, came to my mind immediately uh, when, when I encountered this dream. The dream was of a, a woman patient in her middle age. She dreamed that she was locked in a battle to the death in a conflict with a huge bird. And in the dream she is plotting how to destroy that bird even though she knows that this, uh, that this plan and effort is evil. And just as she is about to bring about the destruction of the bird, as she thinks, and complete the final act of her plot, 
suddenly the situation reverses itself and she realizes abruptly that she doesn't have the superiority over the bird she thought. Tables are turned. Um, and now she is terrified that the huge screeching bird will get her. And in order to keep the bird out, she has covered her whole house with a great plastic tent so the bird can't get in. But in the dream, the bird's gotten in somehow and is silently waiting for her to rest when it will kill her or peck out her eyes. And she's terrified and awakes with a start. This woman is in a conflict with her transpersonal destiny. Uh, she has considerable talent as an, as an artist, um, but she has what I can only call a play orientation to life, and she can't quite make that final commitment to, uh, to put herself in the service of uh, what's required of her. Um, but this, this is clearly uh, an example of the question of a baptism, whether or not she's going to submit to the, to the baptism uh, experience. The outcome is still uncertain. In the light of this dream, uh, one might say, it's as though Christ got into a fight with the descending dove and refused to accept his assignment, you see. Go back where you came from. I don't, don't want any of it. That's, uh, that's the nature of, uh, of, the, of the dream, dream image. Immediately after the account of Christ's baptism, we, we read about uh, the temptation. Because then Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Uh, and then follows the, uh, the three temptations. He's asked to turn stones into bread. He's asked to cast himself off the cliff to prove that Yahweh will protect him. Uh, and he's offered uh, worldly power if he will, if he will worship uh, Satan. Um, this sequence of images of first bat baptism, descent of the, of the Holy Spirit, and the inspirational uh, quality, I mean by that, the, the inspiring, the, the breathing in of the Spirit, uh, followed by the temptation, uh, is uh, absolutely characteristic of psychological experience. Uh, the temptation refers to the danger of inflation following the experience of a connection with the self. And it happens, it happens uniformly. And the, the danger of inflation is uh, indicated by the image of Christ being led to, to a high mountain. Height is an inflation image. You see, it's the same spirit. If we, uh, if we understand this material psychologically, uh, it's not that there are two different spirits, not the Holy Spirit descending as the dove and an evil spirit that takes them off to be, ten to be tempted. Uh, it's two different aspects of the same spirit. Uh, it blessed Christ at the time of his uh, commitment to his vocation, but then it turned diabolical as an expression of the fact that uh, there was a temptation to, uh, to being inflated. Uh, it corresponds to the trickster aspect of the unconscious, which is very dangerous for the naive ego. ego. Um, experiences of the, of the self and what's represented by uh, the, the baptism imagery uh, 
gives one a, a feeling of, uh, of well-being and specialness and uh, I'm the one sort of feeling that is very dangerous. And that danger is represented by the, by the image of the temptation. Now, in, in the scriptural account, uh, Christ uh, avoids that temptation. However, in the total picture, he doesn't entirely, because uh, what happens in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is something analogous to the temptation, but more conscious. He's, he's going to his fate and he knows it, but then he does allow, he does allow the trappings of grandeur to be applied to him in the triumphal entry in Jerusalem. I'm not going to talk about that particular image except to mention it here as, uh, as an important one and it's, uh, it was a necessary part of, this, of the whole sequence that he uh, allow himself to be, uh, to be given that uh, victorious uh, parade and also to allow himself to, to succumb to his anger against the money changers and uh, uh, live out the wrath of Yahweh, so to speak. Uh, it, it's all part of the necessary sequence, but uh, it's also analogous to the temptation imagery uh, from the evil spirit. I've just been talking about baptism. We've moved move on from, from the baptism. You recall I said that in the, uh, in the books of ours, uh, the, the ministry of Jesus is almost never mentioned. It's, it doesn't, uh, doesn't fall into the pictorial representations. Uh, it's as though it's, it's not archetypal enough. It doesn't belong to the fundamental archetypal sequence. Um, we uh, pass through the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which I alluded to. Uh, we pass through the, uh, the Last Supper, uh, another certainly very major image in this cycle, and come to my next image, which is the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. The account in Matthew 26 reads as follows. There are parallels <clears throat> in Mark and Luke too. Then Jesus came with them to a small estate called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, stay here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him and sadness came over him in great distress. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Wait here and keep awake with me. And going on a little further, he fell on his face and prayed. My father, he said, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, let it be as you, not I, would have it. He came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, so you had not the strength to keep awake with me one hour. You should be awake and praying not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, My father, he said, if this cup cannot pass by without my drinking it, your will be done. He came back again, found them sleeping. Their eyes were so heavy. He went away again, prayed for the third time, repeating the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and said to them, You can sleep on now and take your rest. Now the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. My betrayer is already close at hand. To this account should also be added uh, a portion from Luke 22, which adds a, another very important image. We read there, <clears throat> then an angel appeared to him, coming from heaven to give him strength. In his anguish he prayed even more earnestly, and his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. The name Gethsemane uh, I understand, means oil press. Perhaps it's significant that the place where olives had their oil extracted is the place where Christ sweat drops of blood. This image 
of profound grief and heavy depression to the point of grief, that the point of death that uh, extracts uh, uh, bloody sweat is an image of an extraction process. I've reproduced a picture in Ego and Archetype. It's uh, picture 46 that shows Christ in a wine press as a grape and having, having juice extracted from him, uh, which is similar to what would happen in, in an olive press. Then on the way to Gethsemane, Jesus tells his disciples, you will all lose faith in me this night, for the scripture says, I shall strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. This is a reference to Zechariah, 13th chapter, where we read, Awake, sword, this is Yahweh speaking, Awake, sword, against my shepherd and against the man who is my companion. It is Yahweh Sabaoth who speaks. I am going to strike the shepherd so that the sheep may be scattered and I will turn my hand against the weak. Well, it's very distressing to read things like this in Holy Red. It can only mean psychologically, I think, considering the imagery of sheep and shepherds, it can only mean that Yahweh is fed up with sheep-like people. And the passage, since it's directly referred to in the Gethsemane experience, it tells us that the Gethsemane experience involves a loss of faith, a loss of confidence, and morale. You see, Christ says to his disciples, you will all lose faith in me this night. For the scripture says, I will strike the shepherd. Now what's implied here then, that although the loss of faith is not imputed to Christ, it's imputed to his disciples, you could say it's carried by shadow figures, auxiliary shadow figures, the idea of the loss of faith. But the loss of faith of the apostles would foreshadow the despairing cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? There's a very touching uh, passage in a medieval meditation on the life of Christ that reads, that reads this way, talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, although he is God and equal to his Father, referring to Christ, and co-eternal, he appears to have forgotten that he is God and prays like a man. See, this theme of loss of faith comes up again, as I said, on the cross. Uh, where, and it's uh, the, quoting the first opening lines of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jung tells us, you can find this in one of his uh, conversations published in C.G. Jung Speaking, that this cry of Christ on the cross, this cry of loss of faith, which is sort of presaged in the Garden of Gethsemane, indicates that his sense of mission had left him. And something of the same question he's wrestling with in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, there is, uh, according to a certain heresy, the docetist heresy, which is very significant psychologically. According to this heretical idea, uh, Jesus was just an ordinary human being uh, until the moment of his baptism, at which time the divine Christ descended and uh, took up dwelling in his body. 
it then performed all the miracles and did the teaching and uh, uh, carried him through right up to the point when he was nailed on the cross, then it deserted him. There's something profoundly significant psychologically about that image because it expresses the fact that there are two entities within the human personality. There's the ego, the, the human, fallible, weak, uh, stumbling ego, and there's the greater personality, the self, uh, or what in this, uh, in this setting would be represented as the Christ. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the canonical account itself tells us that uh, his sense of mission left him on the cross. What does this mean psychologically? I think it refers to the fact that one can never reach a state of certainty in the process of individuation. Certainty is inflation. Spare me dealings with anybody that's absolutely certain, especially about religious matters. Uncertainty is the human condition, and we can preserve our humanity only as long as we, we retain our uncertainty, even, even as we try to follow what we uh, sense to be a transpersonal purpose and a transpersonal direction. Certainty cannot be properly a, a part of that experience uh, because uh, Certainty is inflation. It's omniscience. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, whenever one uh, starts feeling too, uh, too certain, uh, I, I advise that he subject himself to uh, severe critique. It might spare him a much bigger fall if he does it willingly. You see, as the medieval uh, book put it, Christ forgot that he was God in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, that corresponds to what happens in the course of individuation. We have an experience of the self. We have uh, some real realization that there is that other larger center of being. But then we forget it. And then we're exposed to further experiences of doubt, darkness, and uncertainty. And that's the price we pay for keeping in touch with the unconscious. It's the price we pay for maintaining our humanity. We have to forget that we had the experience of the self. Otherwise, uh, it amounts to a kind of uh, divine inflation. You know, Jung clung to uncertainty to the very end of his life. On the last page of Memories, De Dreams, Reflections, uh, he speaks of life as being both meaningful and meaningless. And he concludes by saying, probably as in all metaphysical questions, both are true. Life is or has meaning and meaninglessness. I cherish the anxious hope that meaning will preponderate and win the battle. Well, that doesn't sound like certainty to me. Another aspect of the Gethsemane image is that it emphasizes the fact that uh, suffering is a crucial part of the process. The important point is to accept the suffering one encounters. You know, we all have the deeply ingrained infantile notion that we're supposed to be happy. That's not true. We are supposed to suffer. If you attach any psychological credence to what I'm describing as the Christian archetype, if, if it has any general validity, can you escape the conclusion uh, that, uh, that is implied that we're supposed to suffer? Another important image in this uh, picture is the, is the image of the, the cup. Uh, 
uh, Christ says, if possible, let this cup pass from me. And in probably the majority of the medieval representations of the uh, agony in the garden, uh, the artist shows Yahweh reaching down from a cloud in heaven, handing Christ a cup, a communion cup specifically. Usually it's a cup and a wafer. In other words, it's a precise uh, reference uh, to communion symbolism. So it's as though uh, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane is uh, celebrating communion. Now, this image of the cup, I think, is a, provides us a good opportunity to, to check up on some of the uh, Old Testament amplifications. The, the Greek word is potirion, and uh, uh, we can check up uh, where that word is used in the Septuagint <laughs> of the Old Testament and get some sense then of, of what, the, uh, what the associations to that term were uh, for someone acquainted with the Old Testament. Uh, this term has two chief usages in the Septuagint. Uh, one usage uh, refers to the cup of wrath of Yahweh, and this cup is filled with stupefying wine. It's found in a number of places. I won't read them all off. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Zechariah, Psalms, Lamentations cup of stupefying wine that's, that's Yahweh's wrath, that's one. But in another series of passages, the cup is used as a means of divination, um, as one's portion, or as the container to hold lots that one draws his divine portion out of. And in this usage, it signifies the fortune that falls to an individual. Let me give you a few examples of these two usages. In Psalm 16, we read, O Lord, my allotted portion and my cup, you it is who hold fast my lot. For me, the measuring lines have fallen on pleasant sights. Fair to me, indeed, is my inheritance. Well, the psalmist here is praising God for giving him a, a happy cup, happy cup of fortune, you see. Uh, that's good fortune. Uh, in Psalms 11, we read, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. So that's bad fortune from, from, uh, from a cup. That is examples of the cup of wrath. Psalm 75, we read, Yahweh is holding a cup of frothing wine, heavily drugged. He pours it out, they drain it to the dregs, all drink of it, the wicked of the earth. And in Isaiah 51, Awake, awake to your feet, Jerusalem, you who from Yahweh's hand have drunk the cup of his wrath, the chalice of stupor you have drained to the dregs. Well, you see, these amplifications give us some idea, then, if we approach this image the same way we approach a dream, gives us some idea as to what it is Christ is drinking when he accepts that cup in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, we see then that he's being required to consume, digest, and assimilate divine wrath. Or in psychological terms, we don't speak of divine wrath, we speak of the intense affects of the uh, primitive archetypal psyche. That's the clean clinical terminology that we use. But it's divine wrath, that's what it is. And if the, if the ego uh, takes that cup, then, uh, then he has the task of, of assimilating it and uh, uh, for the purpose of transformation. And this brings up the whole, uh, the whole theme of the transformation of uh, the primordial deity uh, into a more differentiated deity, which I won't go into now, but that, that is implied by that imagery. 
Another feature of the Gethsemane experience is that it seems to be plagued with sleepiness. There are a group of four people, Christ and three, the three apostles, and three of the four uh, sleep through the whole thing. And Christ pleads for them to keep awake and to, to watch is uh, the word he used. Gregorio, watch with me. But they're not able to. This, this word, to watch, it means to be alert and vigilant. And it's used, for instance, in the 16th chapter of Revelation, where the great day of God Almighty is described. And, and it says, I shall come like a thief. Happy is the man who has stayed awake, Gregorio, who is who has remained a watcher and not taken off his clothes. I think this emphasis on wakefulness indicates specifically that what is at stake is consciousness. Whenever one dreams one's sleeping, uh, that means uh, you're being too unconscious and you ought to be awake. You shouldn't be asleep in your dreams. Uh, You should be awake in your dreams. The common term that's used uh, for the uh, Garden of of Gethsemane event is uh, the term agony. Uh, That's that's a direct uh, translation of of the agonia, a Greek term. It doesn't mean quite or just anguish. It's it's got more the, uh, the meaning of an intense contest or conflict. And Christ alludes to this uh, conflict uh, when he speaks uh, that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the conflict is between what he calls the spirit and the flesh. And in this intense conflict of opposites, one or two, one of two possible actions uh, prevail, according to this image. Either one goes to sleep or one prays. Um, if one is able to keep awake, prayer or psychologically active imagination is what's required to uh, to do it. Uh, because in order for the ego to remain conscious in a time of such uh, conflict and anguish, it has to have the cooperation with with the unconscious in order to endure the conflict of the opposites. And uh, prayer then is what is designed to establish that connection with with the self that makes it bearable. And that connection is indicated by the passage in Luke which speaks of an angel coming to minister to Christ. I have a picture of that ego and archetype. It's a beautiful and a profound uh, image. But if one, uh, if one uh, can't pray, then he has to go to sleep. Uh, the s- sleep is a, is a kind of, uh, it's a viable alternative. We mustn't, we mustn't appreciate sleep uh, because it brings a kind of healing connection with the unconscious, in an unconscious way, so to speak. And, uh, if that's what's necessary, then one must permit himself to do that too, but not in dreams. It's interesting to the psychologist uh, who, who thinks in terms of the four functions uh, to note that one figure prays and three figures sleep. That would suggest that uh, the psychological uh, situation that's referred to by this image uh, is one in which only there's only one fourth realization of of what the image refers to. Uh, It might correspond to the fact that the image is a metaphysical idea but not yet a psychic reality. Uh, Anyway, it's interesting to note that uh, it's it's a one, one, three uh, proportion. And to say a little more about this presence of the strengthening angel, uh, this this feature is reminiscent of uh, 
of the lines of uh, Holderlin's poem that Jung was fond of quoting. Wo aber Gefahr ist, wachs das rettende Auk, which could be translated as, where there is danger grows also the rescuing power. But the, the, the two go right together. And that the ministering angel, the rescuing agency, where does, where does it show up? It shows up in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think relevant to this same matter is this statement of, of Jung's, which is a very profound expression of, of the same, same point. This comes from Psychology and Alchemy, paragraph 32. <clears throat> Jung says, The highest and most decisive experience of all is to be alone with one's own self, or whatever else one chooses to call the objectivity of the psyche. The patient must be alone if he is to find out what it is that supports him when he can no longer support himself. Only this experience can give him an indestructible foundation. In a nutshell, danger and salvation come in the same package. That's not part of the quote, you understand. That's, that's my rule. As I mentioned, it's, it's commonly represented that Christ is accepting a communion cup and a wafer. In other words, he's eating and drinking his own flesh and blood. So that the Garden of Gethsemane really completes the symbolism of the Last Supper. Jung has an important uh, statement on this subject that I want to uh, refer to. This comes from paragraph 511 of Mysterium Conjunctionis. Uh, I'm going to read a bit of it. It's uh, so important that uh, allow me to quote this fairly lengthy quotation. Only the living presence of the eternal images can lend the human psyche a dignity which makes it morally possible for a man to stand by his own soul and be convinced that it is worth his while to persevere with it. Only then will he realize that the conflict is in him, that the discord and tribulation are his riches, which should not be squandered by attacking others. I'm reminding you that this quotation elaborates the theme that, that danger and salvation come in the same package, and that, that it involves the endurance of conflict. The discord and tribulation are his riches, which should not be squandered by attacking others, and that if fate should exact the debt from him in the form of guilt, it is a debt to himself. Then he will recognize the worth of his psyche, for nobody can owe a debt to a mere nothing. But when he loses the, his own values, he becomes a hungry robber. He then refers to a alchemical text that he's commenting on that involves uh, the eating of peacock's flesh and lion's blood which by a, by a queen and he equates this with eating her own flesh and her own blood so he says this figure must eat her own flesh and her own blood if the projected conflict is to be healed, it must return into the psyche of the individual where it had its unconscious beginnings. He must celebrate a last supper with himself and eat his own flesh and drink his own blood, which means that he must recognize and accept the other in himself, the other that he's in conflict with. But if he persists in his one-sidedness, uh, the two lions, which are referred to in the text, will tear each other to pieces. Is this perhaps the meaning of Christ's teaching that each must bear his own cross? For if you have to endure yourself, how will you be able to <clears throat> rend others also? 
This is the psychological essence, as I see it, of the image of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ is enduring the two sides of himself. So that the drinking of the cup of Gethsemane corresponds to the drinking the cup of what oneself is. Uh, it's probably the fundamental image of, of Jungian analysis and individuation, of drinking that cup uh, of one's own blood, one's own being. Eric Neumann expresses a very interesting aspect of this process in his book on depth psychology and the new ethic. I think this is the best paragraph in the book. So I've, I've extracted the, the finest thing from it. You won't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> Which The rest of it is just commentary on this paragraph, but if, if you need the commentary. But uh, Neumann says this. <clears throat> To the extent that he does live in reality the whole range of his particular life, the individual is an alchemical retort in which the elements present in which the elements present in the collective are melted down and refashioned to form a new synthesis, which is then offered to the collective. But the predigestion of evil which he carries out as a part of the process of assimilating his shadow makes him at the same time an agent for the immunization of the collective. An individual's shadow is invariably bound up with the collective shadow of his group, and as he digests his own evil, a fragment of the collective evil is invariably co-digested at the same time. Do you get that? It's it's a really a very important idea. Um, to the extent that uh, one really assimilates his own shadow and does not uh, does not uh, contribute to uh, the psychic pollution by projecting it, uh, he is uh, he is contributing to the uh, collective process of the digestion of of. Uh, collective evil. And in the case of Christ, who accepted uh, uh, the cup of Yahweh's wrath and drank it to the dregs, that uh, event had the effect of digesting Yahweh's evil and thereby transforming him into a loving God. That's not theology, that's psychology. Well, I'm getting tired, so I see I don't have much farther to go. Uh. <clears throat> There's an alchemical text that uses the, the Garden of Gethsemane image uh, in a reference to the uh, sweating drops of blood. This uh, matter is to be found in uh, volume 13 of the Collected Works, paragraph 390. Um, Jung quotes a text of Gerhard Dorn, who was a late alchemist, and Gerhard Dorn's text speaks of a true man who will come to earth and will sweat bloody drops of a rosy hue, whereby the world will be redeemed from its fall. And this corresponds to the blood of their stone. He's talking about the philosopher's stone uh, that will free the leprous metals and also men from their diseases. Uh, for in the blood of this stone is hidden its soul. So what he's presented us with is the image of of the philosopher's stone which sweats drops of rosy colored fluid which um, which is a healing elixir. Now comes Jung's uh, comment about this. The stone that sweats blood is of course a precise parallel to Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Psychologically it means that the extraction of the aqua permanens 
inevitably involves psychic pain and conflict. Every psychic advance of man arises from the suffering of the soul. Jung gives the following commentary to Dorn's text. Since the stone represents the homo totus, the, the total man, it is only logical for Dorn to speak of the putissimus homo, the most true man, when discussing this arcane substance and its bloody sweat. He is the arcanum, and the stone and its parallel or prefiguration is Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. This most pure, most true man must be none other than the entire man, the man who knows and possesses everything in human and is not adulterated by any influence or admixture from without. This man will appear on earth only in the last days. He cannot be Christ, for Christ by his blood has already redeemed the world from the consequences of the fall. It's not a question of a future Christ, but rather of the alchemical preserver of the cosmos, representing the still unconscious idea of the whole and complete man, who shall bring about what the sacrificial death of Christ has obviously left unfinished, namely the deliverance of the world from evil. Like Christ, he will sweat a redeeming blood, but it is rosy-colored, not natural or ordinary blood, but it's symbolic blood, a psychic substance, the manifestation of a certain kind of eros, which unifies the individual as well as the multitude in the sign of the rose and makes them whole. Last item. I draw your attention to the fact that um, in the passage I quoted, Christ says, Now the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. This is what he calls himself in a number of uh, places. Son of Man. And it's just one of many examples of the use of that term. It's a very mysterious term <clears throat> that has uh, elicited vast amounts of uh, attention from biblical scholars. I have a whole book on the subject, The Son of Man, in literature and tradition or something like that. You see, the dogma of the church labeled Christ as the Son of God and the Messiah, but Christ did not apply either of those images to himself. He applied the term Son of Man. If you follow up the, uh, the sources of that, of that term, um, you come to a realization that that term refers to what Jung calls the Anthropos the great man, the original man, um, the man in capital letters. Uh, this is one of the images of the, of the self, and uh, uh, Christ applies this, uh, this term to himself. Uh, I think there are two aspects to it. One is the inner aspect, which will correspond to what we call the self, the other is the outer aspect that uh, we don't say so much about, and that is that it's the, uh, the Anthropos, the great man, uh, is the personification of the human race as a whole. It's a personification of us as species. And as one makes connection with the self and its inner aspect, one simultaneously makes connection with the outer aspect, too. Uh, that's why uh, individuation, uh, far from being an isolating, uh, having an isolating effect, has just the reverse. It, uh, it relates one to the species, because the, the, our species is one great man, really, and the image of that fact resides within us as, as an image of the self. And it's the dawning awareness of that fact 
that this cycle brings about. But why the Son of Man? That's, that's still to be explained. It suggests that what we're dealing with is the second generation of the great man, of the self, of, uh, of the total one. It reminds us of similar alchemical terms for the philosopher's stone. For instance, one of the, one of the synonyms for philosopher's stone is the Phileus Philosophorum, the son of the philosophers. Uh, in other words, what the alchemist meant by that is that the stone was the son of the alchemist who made it. Because the, the alchemists were the philosophers, that's the, that's the name they applied themselves. Um, I think we can't escape the, uh, the idea that the term son has some reference to the ego or some experience or operation of the ego because the ego is the son of the unconscious. Uh, or at the very least, if that's too much to say, we can at least uh, consider that the, the term son of man refers to a, a reborn, regenerate, second generation version of the original self that uh, somehow is brought about through, through cooperation or efforts of the ego. And that's the thing that's implied in the Christian archetype, namely that uh, Christ, in his resurrected and eternal form, anyway, is uh, the second generation of God. Uh, he's, uh, he's a reborn, regenerate uh, Yahweh. Anyway, it's a profound and mysterious image, and with it, I shall say good night. So far, we've made a rather rapid transit around three quarters of this cycle that I've schematized. There's been the Annunciation, the Nativity, the flight into Egypt, the Massacre of the Innocents, the Baptism of Christ, the temptation, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the taking of Christ, his trial before Pilate, before Herod, his mocking, his flagellation, his crucifixion, his death on the cross, the deposition from the cross, the lamentation, the entombment, and now we come to the image of the resurrection. Before speaking briefly of that, I want to draw special attention to the imagery, especially the apocryphal imagery, uh, that uh, paralleled the uh, period from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Uh, according to that imagery, Christ went to hell. This is the so-called episode of the harrowing of hell. And uh, the, uh, the doors of hell were, were shattered. He, he entered hell, or sometimes it's called limbo, and there uh, rescued the ancient worthies that were confined there and uh, resurrected them just as he was to be resurrected. This is a particularly significant image psychologically. Uh, the, the idea that at the time that Christ was uh, dead to the, uh, to the view of, of the outer world, 
he was very much alive and performing a rescuing function in the world of the, of the dead, namely the world of the unconscious. And this is a uh, very important image expressing what happens when the ego descends into the unconscious and experiences the death of the world because what that amounts to then from the standpoint of the unconscious is the salvation of the ancient rejected lost worthies within the unconscious. It's the, it's the salvation of the, of the unconscious repressed complexes. Uh, and uh, it's a very important image. Anyway, the time has now come that uh, um, the events of Easter Sunday uh, are to be noted. And the image, the typical traditional image that we see in the, in the books of ours for this is uh, an open tomb. The, the slab uh, closing the tomb has been put aside. The tomb is open. Uh, there, the Roman soldiers who have been guarding the tomb are in a state, they've fallen back uh, uh, in, a, in a stupor or, or faint, uh, and uh, the risen Christ is emerging from his tomb, uh, usually, uh, usually holding a, a banner, a banner with a red cross on it, the banner of, of resurrection. And uh, this is the, the image of the return of life after, uh, after death. It's an, it's an image that uh, a sequence, the death and resurrection cycle is a sequence which uh, is not at all confined to the Christian imagery. We have many other examples of it in the ancient Near Eastern religions. Probably the outstanding parallel is uh, the myth of Osiris. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, an archetypal image of, uh, of multiple uh, manifestation. Um, the basic archetypal idea is the death and rebirth of the, of the year spirit. Um, in the course of the cycle of the year, the, uh, the vegetation spirit, the, the spirit of, of life as it manifests itself, uh, has been thought from primitive times uh, ever since to go through a tragic drama. Um, Gilbert Murray has uh, categorized this drama in four stages, which I think uh, are very helpful to, to understand uh, objectively what, what's going on. The four stages that he uh, uh, that he used to describe the tragic drama of the year spirit are first the agon, that is the contest on the part of the protagonist, the year spirit, with evil. This would correspond to Christ's life and ministry. The second stage of the tragic drama is called by Murray the pathos. Uh, that is the suffering and defeat of, of the year spirit, of the, of the, uh, of the hero. He, he, does not, he does not triumph over evil. He's defeated. And that's, uh, that's expressed in terms of Christ's passion and death. The third stage is threnos or mourning, lamentation. And this will correspond to the, uh, to the image of the pieta, the, uh, the lamentation over the dead, defeated Christ when, uh, when despair uh, has, has set in. It seems as though all is lost. The final stage is called theophany. It's the stage of 
divine manifestation, transcendence. It's as though the, the whole sequence uh, has shifted to a, another level of reference and uh, the divine presence intervenes and uh, uh, there is what we call psychologically an enantiodromia so that uh, uh, there is a change from one opposite to the other so that from the, from the depths of, of defeat and despair uh, the resurrection of life takes place. And that uh, that corresponds to the uh, to the resurrection image of Christ. I think this is an important formulation because it helps us to understand in in concise form the uh, the nature of the process of the transformation of the libido that goes on in our own psyche. Um, <clears throat> we go through these four stages, not, not just once, but many times. <clears throat> and what it makes clear is that the transformation process requires suffering and defeat. It's, uh, you don't get transformation with, without it. There can be no rebirth without a death. So that one must go through the death of encounter with the unconscious, because encounter with the unconscious is experienced by the ego as a death. Uh, that's uh, that's inevitable uh, if one's going to be reborn. And uh, therefore, those who never have the experience of defeat, those who are, who are always winners, uh, have this process shortcut, uh, short-circuited, so to speak. And uh, they miss the whole point, uh, which is the, uh, the transformation. Actually, the, uh, the resurrection image in, in the Christian sequence can be thought of as a, as a triad. Um, there's the, the resurrection, the rising up from the tomb, uh, and this is followed by the ascension into heaven, and uh, finally by the, uh, the manifestation of the return of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. According to the church calendar, uh, on Easter Sunday, the dead Christ is uh, resurrected. Uh, he then remains on earth for 40 days with all the significance, the symbolism of the number 40 has attached to it, which I won't go into. And this then ends with the ascension. And 10 days after the ascension, or 50 days after Easter, comes Pentecost signifying the return of Christ in a new form, in the form of the Holy Spirit. We find the ascension described in uh, the first chapter of Acts. I won't read that, but uh, uh, you can look it up uh, if you're interested. Um, except for the last uh, sentence, which says, uh, Why are you men from Galilee standing here looking into the sky? Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, this same Jesus will come back in the same way as you see, have seen him go there. That's, uh, that's a pure psychological remark. When one is familiar with, uh, with certain of the characteristic images of the psyche, then they, they stand out whenever one sees them. That which goes up must come down. The, the interplay of, of the opposites is what's referred to here. Why are you looking up there, men? Because what went up has to come back down again, it says. And uh, um, that is, is the way it happens with the psyche. Now, I think that remark is usually understood to refer to the parousia, the second coming of Christ. However, I think it can more, uh, more appropriately be referred to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He's going to come in only ten days from now, so don't keep craning your necks up. You see, he's coming back down again.
I have to uh, have to move on. Because I want to talk chiefly about about the Pentecost, and uh, this is uh, still in the resurrection. But I must tell you this: the sequence of Christ's death and rebirth as an archetypal phenomenon has different levels of manifestation. Um, my emphasis uh, here in the con- conference has been on the. Uh, the uh, individual manifestation, the way these images express themselves in the individual psyche. But uh, they appear not only there, but also in the historical evolution of the collective psyche. So that there are certain periods in history when God, or rather we better say the God image, (coughs) undergoes death and rebirth, just as Christ does. And it seems pretty evident that we're going through such a period now. It could be said that now, in 1982, we are between Good Friday and Easter Sunday in the collective historical passion drama. Uh, I think of the 20th century as the Holy Saturday of history. God died on the Good Friday of the 19th century. Actually, it happened at the end of the 18th century. Jung Jung pinpointed the exact time, at the time of the French Revolution, when the goddess of reason was enthroned in Notre Dame. Uh, That that was the moment when when God died, but that was was the opening of the 19th century, almost. And all the the poets and uh, sensitive individuals of the 19th century uh, mourned uh, mourned that fact uh, of, of his death. He died in the 19th century, uh, on Good Friday. We're living in the Holy Saturday of the 20th century. And if I'm reading the right archetypal roadmap, then uh, there'll be a resurrection on the Easter of the 21st century. Approximately. Jung writes, where does this come from? This comes from volume 11, paragraph 145. Jung says, when Nietzsche said God is dead, he uttered a truth which is valid for the greater part of Europe. People, people were influenced by it, not because he said so, but because it stated a widespread psychological fact. The consequences were not long delayed after the fog of isms, the catastrophe. However, he continues. God's death or his disappearance is by no means only a Christian symbol. The search which follows the death is still repeated today after the death of the Dalai Lama. And in antiquity, it was celebrated in the annual search for the Kore. Such a wide distribution argues in favor of the universal occurrence of this typical psychic process. The highest value which gives life and meaning has got lost. This is a typical experience that has been repeated many times, and its expression therefore occupies a central place in the Christian mystery. The death or loss must always repeat itself. Christ always dies and always he is born, for the psychic life of the archetype is timeless in comparison with our individual timelessness. The present is a time of God's death and disappearance. The myth says he was not to be found where his body laid. He's referring here to the uh, the statement, um, why seek ye the living among the dead? The myth says he was not to be found where his body was laid. Body means the outward visible form, the erstwhile but ephemeral setting for the highest value. The myth further says that the value rose again in a miraculous manner, transformed. 
It appears as a miracle, for when a value disappears, it always seems to be lost irretrievably. So it's quite unexpected that it should come back. The three days descend into hell during death describes the sinking of the vanished value into the unconscious, where by conquering the power of darkness, it establishes a new order and then rises up to heaven again. That is, attains su supreme clarity of consciousness. Now here's, and here's the final one. The fact that only a few people can see the risen one, you know, only a select few uh, saw Christ in his risen form. The fact that only a few people see the risen one means that no small difficulties stand in the way of finding and recognizing the transformed value. That's Jung in, Jung's interpretation of the resurrection image. And with that, I must now move on to our final image, the Pentecost. The account of the Pentecost is found to be found in the second chapter of Acts. I won't read it, but I'll just remind you of it. Just of it is that the, the apostles have assembled, assembled. A mighty wind uh, comes. The, uh, the Holy Ghost uh, descends as a dove and appears on uh, above the heads of each of the apostles as a as a flame. Uh, and uh, those around them are then astonished to discover that uh, even though they come from many different countries and speak different languages, each person hears the speaking of the apostles in their own language so that the, uh, the separation of, uh, of nations uh, and people by separate language is, is overcome and uh, their languages have been, have been unified. And there's also the significant remark <coughs> that someone makes that uh, uh, they must be intoxicated uh, uh, beca because of, of the way they were speaking. And uh, that, that idea of, of intoxication or the ingestion of, uh, of the spirit uh, is, is a part of the symbolism. Now, in, in medieval art, um, the typical uh, image is not the same as the as the scriptural account. That's what's so interesting the, about these matters. Uh, the the collective psyche uh, is is alive and autonomous in in the way it manifests itself, and it uh, it's not a uh, it's not a strict follower of scripture. It, uh, it alters uh, the images to suit itself. And this is an interesting example of it because the characteristic, typical uh, representation of the Pentecost uh, is the assembled apostles and in the center, Mary. Mary isn't in the account. You don't hear anything about Mary in the account of Pentecost, but here she is. And uh, the, uh, the dove of the, of the Holy Ghost is, is descending, and uh, sometimes it, it lights on Mary's head, sometimes rays descend from the ghost and onto Mary's head, and then uh, secondary rays uh, go from the head of Mary to the head of each of the apostles where the, where the flame is lighted. But Mary is the center. Um, <coughs> Middle Ages understood Mary to, uh, to represent the church. Uh, that was specific interpretation of, of Mary in these pictures. Uh, psychologically, we can understand uh, the image of Mary to signify uh, the anima as the mediator uh, between the the ego and the self. Uh, the 
the Pentecostal event brings up the whole question, what is spirit? Because that's what descends. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Uh, Jung goes into that question in the Psychology of the Spirit and Fairy Tales, which is in the Collected Works, Volume 9, 1, um, particularly paragraph 393. He, he gives a, a, a concise statement as to what spirit is empirically stated. I'm not going to read it. I don't have the time, but you can look it up at your leisure. In a nutshell, what it amounts to, uh, the way I would formulate it, is that the Holy Spirit can be understood psychologically as the dynamic aspect of the self expressed as autonomous movement and meaningful image. The, uh, the crucial word in that definition is autonomous. The Holy Spirit is the dynamic aspect of the self, uh, expressed as autonomous movement and meaningful image, with emphasis on the word autonomous. Uh, the Spirit blows where it will, you know, that's, uh, that's the central feature of the spirit as, as experienced. It blows where it will, not where you will, but where it will. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, on occasions when you want to go one way and the spirit's going another way, those are occasions when the autonomous nature of the spirit becomes particularly <laughs> evident. Uh, as long as one's going pretty much the same direction, you don't even know it, you see. But uh, it's, when, it's when there's a conflict between the ego and the, and the self that then the autonomy of, uh, of the spirit uh, becomes evident. Now, Pentecost, you know, was a Jewish festival of weeks that was observed seven weeks after the Paschal feast. And it was a a festival of good cheer, a harvest festival that signified completion of the body harvest. And later it came to commemorate uh, the giving of the law at Sinai. Uh, and the uh, patristic writers uh, made a lot of this uh, parallel between the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the descent of Yahweh uh, on Sinai to give the law. For instance, Jerome says, There is Sinai, here Zion. There the trembling mountain, here the trembling house. There the flaming mountain, here the flaming tongues. There the noisy thunderings, here the sounds of many tongues. There the clangor of the ram's horn, hear the notes of the gospel trumpet. Uh, what he's saying, uh, all he lacks is the psychological terminology, that uh, Pentecost and Sinai are two manifestations of the same archetype. It's a, it's a method of amplification. Other connections with the uh, with the Old Testament, a particularly important one, I think, is that the uh, episode of the Tower of Babel, which is described in the 11th chapter of Genesis, is considered to be the so-called antitype of, of the Pentecost. Let me explain what I mean. In the Tower of Babel episode, man who speaks just one language throughout the earth, uh, tries to build the, the high tower, and in uh, punishment for this hybris, Yahweh brings about a confusion of tongues. Up to then, everyone spoke the same language, but then they started speaking different languages. See, that's the reverse of what happens in the Pentecostal miracle, because in the Pentecost, uh, people of many different languages 
uh, are united by a return to the original language, so to speak, and so that all the different the, uh, languages uh, were understood as one. This is very interesting psychologically. Uh, the Tower of Babel experience represents uh, a process of separatio, what we might call the logos aspect of the Holy Spirit, whereas the Pentecost event represents a conjunctio, a uniting, a bringing together, uh, and therefore uh, would uh, be a manifestation of the eros aspect of the Holy Spirit. Um, there are really two aspects of the same phenomenon of an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And if one reads uh, these images psychologically, he will see this sort of thing running through a lot of the material. You, you'll rem this is, sounds very familiar to what I spoke of earlier in the parallel between uh, uh, the Virgin Mary and Eve, you see. Uh, they were the same thing at, uh, at opposite uh, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum, so to speak, and so it is here. Uh, these are two aspects of the same phenomenon of encounter with the Holy Spirit. First it separates and alienates, and then later it unites. And this is the way it happens in individuation. Uh, for example, Fire is, is one of the one of the images of the, uh, of the of the Pentecostal event and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I recall a patient uh, whose initial dream on, on coming to see me was that uh, his parents' house was on fire and he had to flee from it. This man didn't didn't live literally at home, but he lived psychologically at home. He was still. Uh, living in the state of participatio mystique with the family cycle, psyche. This dream told him that uh, uh, that house was on fire and he had to vacate that psychological dwelling place. He had to separate from, from his uh, parents psychologically uh, in order to, uh, to go on his own way. That would be an example of the Tower of Babel manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit as a uh, separating uh, dynamism. Uh, at a later stage of development, uh, it can then have uh, its its uniting aspect. You know, we've we've heard of the Holy Ghost before. We heard of him starting with the Annunciation. That that's uh, uh, he was the impregnating agent of uh, Mary, and. Uh, He again makes his appearance at the baptism and uh, uh, really manifests himself concretely in Christ at that point. So that when, when Christ ascends, he takes the Holy Ghost with him, so to speak. He's been carrying him during his life and, and he's, he leaves the earth deprived of that transcendent factor when, when he ascends. However, we have this, these very interesting statements uh, in John in which Christ informed his apostles uh, that uh, he'd send the Holy Ghost back after he left. He said, don't, uh, uh, don't be distressed that I have to go because I'm going to, uh, uh, after I go, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost back. The word used is the paraclete. Let me, I'm, I can't read all these, but uh, the relevant passages are in John 14 and John 16. And I'm going to read just a few verses from them to give the feeling of, of the instruction that Christ gave his apostles about uh, why he had to go and what, what he would send back after he'd left. I must tell you the truth, it is for your own good that I am going, because unless I go, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will show the world how wrong it was. 
about sin and about who was the right and about judgment. And then another place, I shall ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete to be with you forever, that spirit of truth whom the world can never receive since it neither sees nor knows him, but you know him because he is with you, he is in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. So that uh, can't be more explicit than that. And what these passages mean, as, as I understand them psychologically, is that a particular concrete manifestation of the Holy Ghost, namely Christ in this case, must be lost, must die, must disappear in order for one to develop an individual relation to the Holy Ghost directly. In other words, a projection must be withdrawn. The imagery is so clear-cut, especially in these passages of John, that what one would expect psychologically then is that um, the death of Christ would be followed with the return of the Holy Ghost and the, the beginning of uh, individual relation to the Holy Ghost. In other words, one, one would expect that the, uh, the process of individuation would have been discovered then, but it didn't happen that way. The collective psyche wasn't ready for such an individual experience. So what happened instead was that a new collective vessel was built to contain the Holy Ghost, namely the Church. You know, Pentecost is considered as the birthday of the Church. Pope Leo said, the Church which already conceived came forth from the very side of the second Adam when he was, as it were, sleeping upon the cross first showed herself in a marvelous manner before men on the great day of Pentecost. See, that's why the Virgin Mary had to be put in there, uh, because uh, she represented the, uh, the church. That just means that the anima function had to be carried by the church uh, at that level of the collective psyche. As another... Uh, uh, churchman says, the Holy Ghost's mission to the church is to ensure the safe custody of an unchanging revelation. For after the death of the apostles, no new economy or new revelation was to be expected. And further, there was that there never has been nor will be any objective increase in revealed truth. In other words, the Holy Ghost may not manifest himself to an individual. He's con he or she is contained in the church. In, in the church. Um, that means then that uh, Pentecost is a repeat of the Annunciation on a second collective level. The first Annunciation was to the Virgin Mary. The second Annunciation is to the Church, the Church which then gives birth to the body of Christ, the, uh, the body of believers. The Church has now gone through the uh, same incarnation cycle that uh, is pictured in the life of Christ and uh, we're now ready for another Pentecost, another Annunciation. Um, once again, my thought is, this time it's going to be directed to individuals. But maybe I'm wrong. We'll see. The whole, the whole notion of the, of the Holy Ghost 
was built into a, an elaborate doctrine of, of the Trinity in the, uh, in the early years, early centuries of the church. And I would uh, uh, draw your attention Jung's fine essay on the subject of the Trinity in volume 11 of the collected works. There's one, one aspect of that doctrine that I think is particularly fascinating psychologically. First of all, an aside. You know, we modern people uh, depreciate the ancients for devoting such passionate intensity in doctrinal disputes uh, or uh, we, we scorn the medieval scholastics because they uh, spent so much libido concerning themselves with uh, what seem like outlandish images. How many angels can be uh, can stand on the head of a pin, things like that. We just demonstrate our own ignorance of the reality of the psyche by such scorn. The fact is that if a particular image has the, the power to, to grip multitudes of people and engage them in intense uh, uh, controversy or, or intense endeavor of, a, of uh, any kind, that's an evidence of the power of that image. That's an evidence of its archetypal dimension. Um, and such is the case in this uh, profound controversy that uh, racked the early church concerning the uh, the nature of the of the Holy Ghost. As the creed was being hammered out, uh, the uh, particularly relevant phrase concerned the Holy Ghost uh, read as follows. We believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father. A contrary party said that will not do that is not an adequate description of the uh, of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost proceedeth not only from the Father but also from the Son and therefore this other party said you must we must include in the Creed the Holy Ghost who proceedeth from the Father and from the Son the Latin is filioque and the Son um, that's the filioque controversy. Now, from the standpoint of our modern rationalistic uh, position, uh, that may not seem very important, but the fact that such a profound controversy could emerge is a pointer to the fact that it is important. See, if you take the standpoint of empirical psychology, you don't impose a theory as to how things ought to be. You look at them and see the way they are. It was important, and therefore it's up to us to understand what that importance means. The way it was finally resolved was that the Western Church, Roman Catholicism, incorporated the filioque into the creed so that uh, in the Western Church, the Holy Ghost is defined as proceeding from the Father and from the Son. The Eastern Church, the Orthodox branch, uh, took the opposite road and maintained the position that in their creed the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father alone. Now I think that's of great importance psychologically and I think it explains a uh, basic psychological difference between uh, the collective psyche of the East and the West. Uh, because what it means psychologically is that the Western psyche has been has built into its root myth the fact that God needs man. 
because from one standpoint anyway, to have the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Son as well as from the Father uh, alludes to the idea that the ego contributes to the reality of the Holy Spirit and is not just a passive uh, recipient of it. And it's then an indication of the profound importance of uh, ego development uh, in the West. And the, the eastern part of Christendom uh, has, a, uh, has a lesser emphasis on that, uh, on that aspect. So I hope I've made clear that, from my brief remarks anyway, that we have now gone through two cycles of, of this uh, incarnation cycle. The first cycle was uh, expressed in the, in the life of Christ and the imagery that uh, constellated around that life at the beginning of, the, of our era. The second cycle is the cycle of the church that was born at Pentecost and gave birth to the body of Christ, uh, the, the body of collective believers who have lived through the, the same cycle as did Christ. And uh, now the question comes uh, about the possibility of another Pentecost, another Annunciation, another descent of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And this brings us to the notion of continuing incarnation. This was perhaps Jung's final and most profound idea that uh, he, uh, he developed in his last years. The idea of continuing incarnation. And with a few quotes from Jung about that possibility, I'm going to end my presentation. In answer to Job, one finds in paragraph 657 the following statement. God's incarnation in Christ requires continuation and completion because Christ, owing to his virgin birth and his sinlessness, was not an empirical human being at all. As stated in the first chapter of John, he represented a light which, though it shone in the darkness, was not comprehended by the darkness. He remained outside and above mankind. Job, on the other hand, was an ordinary human being, and therefore the wrong done to him and through him to mankind can, according to divine justice, only be repaired by an incarnation of God in an empirical human being. This act of expiation is performed by the paraclete, for just as man must suffer from God, so God must suffer from man, otherwise there can be no reconciliation between the two. The continuing direct operation of the Holy Ghost on those who are called to be God's children implies, in fact, a broadening process of incarnation. Christ, the Son begotten by God, is the firstborn, who is succeeded by an ever-increasing number of younger brothers and sisters. These are, however, neither begotten by the Holy Ghost nor born of a virgin, at least not concretely. This may be prejudicial to their metaphysical status, but their merely human birth will in no sense endanger their prospects of a future position of honor at the heavenly court, nor will it diminish their capacity to perform miracles. Their lowly origin, possibly from the mammals, does not prevent them from entering into a close kinship with God as their father and Christ as their brother. In a metaphys metaphorical sense, indeed, it is actually a kinship by blood, since they have received their share of the blood and flesh of Christ. I want to read another passage 
from another source that's hidden away, not very well known. But I want to draw to your attention because those of you that are interested in Jung's comments about religion. This is found in a letter to Père, Père Lachey, written in 1954, and it's found in volume 18 of the collected works, paragraph 1551. Père Lachey had written a little book on the Holy Ghost and sent a copy to Jung, and uh, that, uh, that inspired Jung uh, to, to write a, a quite lengthy reply. It gives us the opportunity uh, to, to have spelled out very explicitly uh, Jung's notion about uh, uh, the psychology of the Holy Ghost. I'm only, re- only going to read one, one paragraph, but this letter is many pages long. I, I urge you to look it up. He says, there is a continuing and progressive divine incarnation. Thus man is received and integrated into the divine drama. He seems destined to play a decisive part in it. That is why he must receive the Holy Spirit. I look upon the receiving of the Holy Spirit as a highly revolutionary fact, which cannot take place until the ambivalent nature of the Father is recognized. If God is the summum bonum, the incarnation makes no sense, for a good God could never produce such hate and anger that his only son had to be sacrificed to appease it. The Midrash says that the sofar is still sounded on the Day of Atonement to remind Yahweh of his act of injustice towards Abraham by compelling him to slay Isaac and to prevent him from repeating it. A conscientious clarification of the idea of God would have consequences as upsetting as they are necessary. They would be indispensable for an interior development of the Trinitarian drama and of the role of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is destined to be incarnate in man or to choose him as a transitory dwelling place. He has no proper name, says Thomas Aquinas, because he will receive the name of man. That is why he must not be identified with Christ. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit unless we have accepted our own individual life as Christ accepted his. Thus we become the sons of God, fated to experience the conflict of the divine opposites represented by the crucifixion. And finally, a couple paragraphs later, he says this. It seems to me to be the Holy Spirit's task and charge to reconcile and reunite the opposites in the human individual through a special development of the human soul. And with that, I conclude, and thank you for your attention. most of you were inquiring about the references to the continuing incarnation. That is found in one reference is answer to Job, paragraph 657, and the following. Another reference is in answer to Job, incidentally, that's in, in volume 11. And uh, another reference is uh, volume 18, entitled The Symbolic Life, paragraph 1551. If you really want to get into deep water, I'll mention one more reference that I did not state before. That's a most profound letter uh, written in 1956 which is to be found in volume 2 of the Jung letters starting with page 313 
That's that's postgraduate work. No, not the last one isn't on the tape. The others, the others, the the. I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. Now let me uh, try to respond to to some of these uh, questions. I, I will not be able to address myself to all of them, and I apologize for that uh, because uh, it says nothing about the value of the question. It, it's only a question of, of whether or not uh, uh, I've got something to, to say to it that can fit into the context of, of this audience, and if I haven't, then I have to, to let it go. So please don't be offended if I don't answer your question specifically. One thing that has really alarmed me, two people say you say the Holy Ghost cannot manifest itself to an individual. Is that what you heard me say? No. That really alarmed me. That idea may have come from my remarks about the fact that the church was built to contain the Holy Ghost at the beginning of the era. And therefore, at that time, it did not, uh, it did not follow the, the direction of manifesting itself to, whole, uh, to individuals in general, but rather was contained by the, by the church. And I understand that as a as a necessary phenomenon, you understand, not an aberration, but uh, as necessary for the state of the development of the collective psyche, that uh, manifestation of the Holy Ghost to the individual would have blasted the individual. The, there weren't individual egos uh, available at that time, at least in sufficient number, for this to be a, a widespread phenomenon. But that scared me when I saw that. Several questions also inquire about uh, my thoughts about the modern charismatic movement, uh, and uh, uh, one also inquires about uh, the Holy Spirit as it's thought to manifest itself to the individual uh, with uh, with Quakers. I guess they're speaking of the. The, meet, the Quaker meeting, and, and also the, the notion of the inner light. I do not like to make uh, generalized comments about collective phenomena. The reason is that every collective phenomenon is made up of individuals who, are, who participate in that movement. And the significant carrier of experience is the individual. And any tags or uh, labels that we apply to movements, uh, they're already a, uh, it's already been categorized uh, uh, intellectually uh, and uh, turns into a theoretical construct. And if one speaks in such general generalities and ventures into remarks and interpretations about uh, uh, such movements, he, he operates on the, on the surface, uh, on the intellectual level, uh, because what, what every movement is, is made up of is a, is a group of individuals, each of whom is having his own unique experience. And uh, one cannot know until one has encountered that individual and listened to a description of that experience, what it is and what it means. Uh, therefore, I wouldn't presume to, to make any general remarks about, uh, about such movements. Um, I hope that will suffice for that one. <laughs> Somebody says, are there other ways to become individuated other than uh, 
uh, going to an analyst. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Does continuous incarnation in any way suggest reincarnation? No. <laughs> Two or three um, requests came in for me to say some more about the meaning of the Last Supper. I put that on my, on my cycle there because it's so important, but it's not one of the images I talked about. Uh, however, I alluded to it um, tangentially in talking about the image of the, of the agony in, in Gethsemane because in the representations of that image, uh, so often Yahweh is shown uh, handing Christ a, a cup and wafer and uh, that cup that he is to drink then uh, refers to, to what had just taken place in, in the Last Supper. That was my only reference to it. Um, I don't want to go into it. It's too, it's too big and I can't, uh, I can't do justice to it by a few brief remarks. But those of you that are really interested in it as a subject, I would suggest that you um, read Jung's essay on transformation symbolism in the Mass. Um, he is not talking about the Last Supper in its original imagery, but he's talking about the, uh, the symbolic ritual that uh, grew out of the Last Supper, and he has a lot of wonderful things to say about it. So that should keep you busy for some time. Somebody asked the name of the, of the book uh, that uh, the, the reference of, to Gilbert Murray came from. Uh, this is a, in a contribution that, uh, of Gilbert Murray's that is incorporated in a book called Themis by Jane Harrison. The book is Jane Harrison's book, but he has a chapter, Gilbert Murray has a chapter in it uh, on, uh, on the origins of, uh, of the ancient drama, tragic drama, and that's, that's where that's to be found. Somebody says, this evolution of the new myth, will it require Jungians to take a more active role in the collective, i.e. politics, government, etc.? No. <laughs> I was pleased to come across something the other day. Uh, I forget now. It was either in volume 18 uh, or it was in C.G. Jung speaking. I'm not sure which. But it was a press release that uh, Jung uh, drafted uh, for his arrival in, in America uh, to give the Terry Lectures. Uh, he expected to be uh, interviewed by the press, and uh, he'd had some uh, disagreeable experiences, so he, he just he wrote out his press review in advance. I'm not sure the, the review was ever, or the press release, I'm not sure it was ever uh, actually uh, released or submitted. Uh, but in order to forego questions on politics, uh, Jung says, I despise politics. 95% of which, and this is not a literal quotation, but giving the, the idea, 95% of which is the acting out of personal complexes. <laughs> Where can we get the books you mentioned, the Book of Hours? Uh, I think that's uh, available probably in most any regular bookstore of, of any size. It's published by George Braziller. So it, it's generally available. Uh, certainly they, uh, there are copies of it uh, if you want to uh, order it from the, uh, the Institute Bookstore in Los Angeles.
somebody inquires whether uh, celibacy, the priesthood, uh, that that uh, feature which varies between the Eastern and Western Church uh, may be connected with the, with the filioque controversy. Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought that through, but that's it's, uh, it's an idea. It's, this, it's the sort of thinking I like to encourage, anyway, as to uh, what the archetypal realities are below the surface uh, phenomenon. I'm going to close with uh, a response to one further question, which was not submitted in writing, but which uh, came to me to yes yesterday uh, verbally, and it's it's important enough to to warrant uh, uh, a considered response. The question was, is this material concerning the Christian archetype relevant to Jews? And the further question is, are there Jewish Jungian analysts? To answer the second first, yes, there are many Jewish Jungian analysts. Some of our, some of our finest analysts uh, are and have been Jewish. An outstanding example of that, of course, is Eric Neumann, perhaps the uh, most creative uh, uh, follower of Jung that has yet appeared on, on the scene. And uh, there are, are many uh, fine Jungian analysts, and of course there's a, there is a whole uh, uh, society of Jungian analysts in Israel, in addition to their being scattered, scattered all over. Um, the other question. Is this material relevant to Jews? Indeed it is. And the question uh, calls for a, a certain elaboration on, on my part as to the, as to the nature of, of the material and as to the nature of um, depth psychology and Jungian psychology uh, specifically. See, the Christian archetype what I'm describing is an entity, a psychological entity, observed by the empirical psychological method, which belongs, at least latently, to all. It is not something that belongs just to a particular uh, uh, creedal formulation. And my approach and my method is the method of, of Jungian psychology, which is a science. It's a product of the Western psyche, which has gone through certain phases of development, the most recent phase of which is uh, the scientific phase. But even though Jungian psychology is a science and therefore a product of the Western psyche. Uh, it's relevant not only to the Western psyche, but to, to uh, internationally, to, to all. It has no religious or creedal connections, so that it's, it's equally relevant to, uh, to the Eastern psyche. So far as uh, the Jewish psyche is concerned, Judaism is absolutely basic to the Christian archetype. It is not ailing to it at all. I would remind you that Christianity is a Jewish heresy. That is precisely what it is. Uh, Christ was a Jew, and the, uh, uh, the life he lived and the images that he gave expression to <coughs> grew organically out of, out of his, uh, his Jewish uh, uh, background. The life of Christ parallels the collective life of Israel, as it was religiously understood in the Old Testament. The parallels are made absolutely explicit. 
Another way of saying it is that uh, the, uh, the history of Israel, the sacred history of Israel, and the life of Christ are both expressions of the same phenomenon. They are both uh, expressions of the process of individuation in different contexts, but uh, they, they derive from, from the same imagery and the same basic process. To put it in a nutshell, and you might want to write this one down, Christ is the individual metaphysical hypostasis of Israel as a collective servant of Yahweh. That isn't saying anything that, that isn't, isn't made explicit uh, in, in the New Testament. Uh, it's, it's as though uh, uh, the nation of, of Israel in its uh, sacred history uh, had a dialogue uh, with, uh, with Yahweh and had a task imposed on it and uh, see our material has said that we had a, we had a, a cycle, an incarnation cycle here starting with Sinai you remember Pentecost was equated with Sinai. So that was, that was the first round of this cycle. If I were to be more, more comprehensive, I would have started this cycle with the history of, of Israel rather than the history of Christ. But I can't do everything. But uh, the fact is that uh, the Jewish imagery, the, uh, the Jewish uh, chronicles and the, and the Christian imagery are the same fabric, the same psychic fabric. Uh, furthermore, uh, the the whole notion of the Messiah, which which got uh, quite a bit of notice in the Old Testament, has undergone a lot of elaboration subsequently uh, in Jewish legends. Uh, there's a there's a very fine book I would recommend on this subject by uh, Raphael Patai. Uh, in which he has accumulated uh, the title of it is the Messiah text. He's accumulated all the relevant uh, texts uh, in, in the vast compendiums of Jewish religion, a Jewish legend that referred to the Messiah, a great collective fantasy about the Messiah uh, and what it will be like when the Messiah comes. Uh, see, the basic difference, the basic manifest difference between Christians and Jews is the question of whether or not the Messiah has come. Uh, those, those contained within the Christian church believe that the Messiah has come, that he's Christ. Uh, Jews uh, maintain that uh, the Messiah is yet to come. Now, seeing, seeing that uh, phenomenology psychologically, I would say this about it that both are right and both are wrong. Yes, the Messiah has come in a sense. He's come as an individual metaphysical hypostasis. That's, that's a very precise terminology and uh, think, of, think about it. He's come as an individual metaphysical hypostasis. Uh, so, on the other hand, no, he has not come as a psychic reality, because as, as I said earlier, psychic reality cannot come into awareness until metaphysical reality has died. So uh, a metaphysical hypostasis carries the potentiality of being recognized in the future as psychic reality, but it's not yet achieved. If the Jewish position uh, had not remained alive, the, uh, the opposites would somehow have been, been lost. Uh, the Jews have served a magnificent and 
uh, paid a tragic price uh, for it, function to the, the Christians of uh, reminding them that uh, they, uh, they are, have not yet res- uh, the possessors of, uh, of ultimate and eternal certainty. That they don't have the, uh, the total and final answer. My understanding of it is that uh, the psychological uh, approach can now bring the insight which can unite the Christian and Jewish attitudes because it, uh, it transcends them both and by perceiving that their, uh, their, their roots, their psychological roots, derive from the same source. And um, uh, the Messiah as a psychological reality, namely the self, comes to the extent that individuals uh, come into conscious realization of, of the self. That's, that's the psychological meaning of the messianic age. I have no religious affiliations. But if I were obliged to uh, state my religious identity, I would say I'm one-third Jewish, one-third Catholic, one-third Protestant, and one-third secular humanist. (laughs) A friend of mine said to me once, she thought she was entering the third half of life. That's my justification for my (laughs) four-thirds. It's also symbolically satisfying to me. It gives me a pleasure to say that. (laughs) That's my image of of what the psyche, uh, uh, the collective psyche of of the West is. It's it's those four-thirds thing. And each individual has to discover for himself uh, which particular compartment he he can occupy and if he can occupy two or more compartments at the same time more power to him and if he can truly not not just by artificial tricks of the intellect but truly occupy all four compartments at the same time I think then he's uh, contributing to the uh, peace and unity of the world. Thank you very much.